Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high-quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field-proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at Primary primaryarms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's episode is 354. We're going to be talking about outfitting an armorer. Today's date is September 13th, 2023. Holy crap, I can't believe we're almost out of 23. It's gone by really fast. Everyone on the panel has been through some form of an armorer school. We understand there's a difference between an armorer and a gunsmith. We all have, we have a desire to spread good information. We're going to discuss some of this stuff. Uh, my background's in law enforcement, been doing the cop thing since last century. Part of the duties that I've had as a, as a, as a cop, one of, my, one of my specialties is armor. And I, I currently am a Glock and AR-15. Not all armor schools are the same. They're not all equal. Glock, yeah, that's going to be the same. No matter where you go, pretty much you're going to get the same class. However, with AR-15s, it's not necessarily the case. Um, just before we started, I brought up a couple of classes that I went through. I went through years ago with Ken, Ken Elmore, gone with Will, Will Larson a couple of times. Fantastic classes. There were definitely differences in the classes. Um, just because you take a good class or no, no, uh, let me, let me I'll back up on that. Uh, taking good classes doesn't mean they're all teaching the exact same thing. Like a good firearms program. Go through a good pistol class, go through Blowers, Fisher, all these really good instructors. They're all going to have different takes on things, and they all have the potential of providing some very good insights, though they're not going to teach exactly the same stuff. So we're going to talk about some differences. We're going to talk about a big thing for me was what, what tools are, are necessary, what tools are, what are going to be the better purchases? Do I want to buy the, do I want to go on Amazon and spend $5 on a punch set? Or do I want to get something a little nicer that's going to last me longer? So uh, we're going to do intros here shortly. While people are providing their intros, I'm going to say my favorite thing, make sure your source, you're uh, supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. Right now, social media is not working in our favor. When I say our favor, 
I mean, anything related to the gun community, anything related to gun rights, firearms, manufacturer training, any of that, um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, others are, are kind of, uh, limiting the reach of that kind of content. So that's where you, the listener comes in, support those sources that you found to be beneficial. As these guys talk about their backgrounds, who they represent, the companies they work with, pay attention to that. If these guys are providing good information that helps you, if they're providing something that changes your perspective on something in a positive manner, you probably need to check these guys out on their pages. You probably need to give some follows. You need to do some shares if they're providing stuff that helps you. Because if you're not doing that, the, the platforms we're working on certainly are not doing that. So it really it, it comes down to you to help us out. Uh, that goes with everything primary and secondary. We've been rolling now for a couple minutes. You probably need to hit the like right now because you're going to forget. You're going to get so enamored with these guys. It's going to be amazing what these guys are going to have to say. You're going to get lost in it. The episode is going to be over. You're going to be sad. And then you're going to forget to hit like. So hit like now. So without further ado, we'll do some backgrounds. And what I normally do is I start with the people that have been on, and then I do the person who's never been on last. So, so Josh doesn't have any anxiety. He'll be last. <laughs> Chad. Hello everyone. Thanks for having me, Matt. Um, I'm Chad Albrecht with school of the American rifle. I teach armors classes. Uh, I'm a classically trained gunsmith who got into teaching armor uh, work about the AR-15 specifically. I have a lot of experience with a lot of weapon platforms, but I took a liking to the AR early in my uh, apprenticeship as a gunsmith, and later on as a gunsmith, I got known for working on them locally and uh, just got a knack for the way I diagnose and look at the system as a whole. Um, where I differ from the typical armors course and what I teach is I, I take a little bit of gunsmithing, which can make some armors uncomfortable, and I try to add that to the mix. Um, there's a lot of companies who make parts that aren't always compatible. And uh, my favorite phrase uh, is that AR-15s are sort of like the, the modern 1911. It's, it's really rare to get a box of parts for a 1911 and throw them together and expect for it to work. So the AR is sort of turned into that. You can't always expect your, uh, your parts to be drop in, all the parts to mesh properly. So I teach how to tweak things from an armor and a gunsmith mindset and give everyone a, uh, I hope, a thorough understanding of how the weapon works and things you can do to make it work better. Cool. Mike? Yeah. Hey, dude, it's good to, good to talk to you again, man. It's been mm -hmm. a while since I've been on. Yeah. Um, I'm Mike. I'm, a, I'm one of the co-owners of Sons Liberty Gunworks. Uh, we've been doing this for going on nine years, and I guess November will be nine years now. Um. I started out as an end user uh, with a, like a mechanical and material curiosity for the system, like almost a, almost an obsession. And um, it really wasn't until I took Will Larson's class that I was able to kind of start, uh, you know, quantifying some of the things I'd observe. I, you, you would observe things and you could, you could see certain phenomena, you could identify issues, uh, but, but really kind of dialing it down into a way that was, um, you know, meaningful. Like, I think Will kind of helped me articulate that. And, and he was, uh, he was certainly my mentor for, for many, many years. And I, you know, I owe a lot of where we're at today to, you know, to, to Will, to be honest. Um, and then, you know, a perpetual student, I mean, it, before Sons Liberty became like a, a national brand, one of the things we offered was servicing guns, uh, from anywhere in the country, whether it was a home build, whether it was a an agency, uh, you know, full of guns that needed to be retrofitted or something, or, um, you know, whether it was just factory guns, we got to work on thousands and thousands of guns and we got to get a really good grasp on what worked and what didn't, uh, you, you know, <laughs> you do, you, if you service a few thousand guns from every manufacturer, you can think of, you, you really start to read the brochures quite a bit different. You start to read the product descriptions quite a bit different. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure Chad can can attest to this too. I mean, we've all everybody that's been in this space for a little while, we've seen all the whiz bing shit come through. I've seen so many things come in, be like the the hot thing, and then in the year or two, like just phase completely out because you know the it, it didn't really meet those performance metrics that we're looking for. Um, I believe that a well made and well maintained rifle can go its entire service life without a true mechanical stoppage. Well, you know, I 
I think that there's some preemptive maintenance that you can do. There's certainly some uh, some parts and stuff that I think a, an armorer should have on hand. You know, Chad recently came and taught my guys at the shop, and I got to tell you that was uh, that was enlightening. You know, it was. It's interesting. We were joking about this. Chad and I have come to some of the same conclusions. Uh, you know, he might have used uh, some sophisticated gauges, and I might have, you know, used several cases of ammo. <laughs> but we come to the same conclusion. And whenever you see that consensus there, uh, there's there really is something there. You know. You know, I wonder, <clears throat> having known Will, I wonder if if he had any idea the impact he actually was making and how we still talk to him after his passing. He, he was a pretty humble guy, man. I yeah. think it's just as long as, long as at least once a week, I tell someone to stake their fucking castle. Like, <laughs> That's I'm right. Doing, like I'm doing him justice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Cool. And Josh. Um, Josh, appreciate you having me on. Um, I'm uh, own a company here in Colorado where Different, you know, same industry, different side of it. We're mostly into the uh, soft goods. So we take things a little bit different approach. Um, I came somewhat from the CNC metalworking background. So we did a lot of things automated in that industry, came into the sewing industry and said, what the hell is this? It's a sweatshop, whether you're in China, America, Taiwan, it doesn't matter. It's just a row after row, individual after individual. And so we got really frustrated after that and brainstormed, how do we reinvent the wheel and automate everything. So for example, like on some of the stuff we do, like put here's and whatnot, there's not a single ditch on that entire thing. That's hand sewn. Everything is hundred percent automated. Um, so that's my day job. That's kind of what we do. Um, but ARs is kind of my passion. I'm, you know, very, very big into mechanical operation, went to school for mechanical engineering. Um, and, Chad and Mike just happen to be two of my favorite heroes in this realm. So I'm just super excited to be here. You know, just, it's, it's just an honor. Thank you. And, it, and truly it was spur of the moment. Just thought, Hey, wait a minute. I haven't had Josh on yet. <laughs> and yeah, work well so far it's working out just fine. Um, <laughs> there you go. So I was listening to the sons of Liberty podcast with uh, Mike and Chad talking and some questions started forming in the back of my mind. And some of the questions I had, which basically motivated me to put this episode together was the, the idea of, well, there's no such thing, at least as, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, there's no such thing as an established armor's toolkit. Like, yeah, clearly you go and buy this back talking to Will talking to Ken. It was, you're buying this, this individual thing of this, specific punch you're buying this specific hammer this and it, it, there was not anything that was all in one so it was a bunch of mix and match of of different things to to essentially work as an armor with ar-15s um i hear people reference fix it sticks and things like that and i see ads about it i personally haven't had any any experience with them but i've been hearing good things and i thought you know what it'd be interesting to hear from you guys what has been your experience with some of this? What are some of the tools that you that you recommend? Um, as if anything, it would be helpful for people to know about this stuff before they attend a class. Hopefully, though, if they're working on AR-15s, especially in a, uh, an official capacity, they've already been certified and already have taken a class. But actually, before we go into that, let's just quickly touch on the idea of the difference between an armor and a gunsmith, because Chad brought that up how he's, he's bringing a little bit of gunsmithery into his courses. Chad, how do you define the difference between the two? Um, I'm sure you could get varied definitions depending on who you talk to, but um, the way I look at it is an armor will typically be well-versed in a particular weapon system, and they're trained to bring it back to a certain specification, maybe a factory specification, um, and they're just replacing parts. So they're not going to be breaking out uh, files, stones, Dremel tools. They're not going to be machining anything. Um, they're just going to be replacing part for part. And that is not uh, to disparage them. I think that is a, a very uh, highly sought after skill. Not everybody has the ability to do it, but they're essentially to, you know, condense it down. They are a parts changer. And the gunsmith, they tend to modify things. There's ways to modify things poorly. 
There are ways to modify them sort of so-so <laughs> and properly. Um, gunsmiths can make parts. They can, uh, you know, they can check her, they can forge, they can uh, solder, they can refinish. Um, just about anything under the sun. The, the, the old term gunsmith basically meant a, a master of several trades. So they could do things with brass. They could do things with copper. They could be a blacksmith. And, and it's a little more all encompassing of multiple trades. Yeah. Yeah. And also it seems that uh, becoming an armor is a couple day class versus a gunsmith is, is it pretty much ongoing? Yeah, if it's a never ending thing. Yeah, you can take some online uh, courses. Uh, you can go to uh, specific schools like Colorado School of Trades uh, mm -hmm. to get, uh, I believe it's an associate's degree. That's what my mentor had um, in it. And But most of it, you're really, at, you're forged in fire. Um, yep. It comes through your experience. You get your foundation through education and then you build upon that. And some gunsmith schools do a very poor job of really teaching people the foundation on the most popular weapon system. So if you go to a major gunsmith school, they don't bring in armors and say, hey, we should probably teach you how to work on the most popular rifle in the United States. They really don't. They might teach you how to chamber an AR barrel, but they don't really go into the specifics. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's why people like uh, myself and Mike and, and other schools exist to uh, continue that education. Yeah, good stuff. Mike, anything to add? Oh, Josh. Yeah. Just real quick. I actually almost attended the Colorado School of Trades. I purposely, I purposely, I, I chose not to because of Chad's comment right there. Mm -hmm. When I went, I took a tour, did the whole shtick. Um, and I realized, okay, I don't want to be sanding wood stocks. I want to be working on Glocks and ARs, right? The wood stock is not going to make me money. It can, you know, it's just a different you know, unique, specific skill. And I just didn't see the ROI there, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Anything to add, Mike? No, I mean, I think I think what, what these guys have said is, is, is pretty spot on. I mean, gunsmithing to me is, uh, you know, like old world artisan kind of stuff almost. You know, I mean, you're not, you're not learning like a, you're not becoming a specialist in a platform. You're, you're becoming you know, a, a, a craftsman, like you said, like, we know, sanding stocks, bluing barrels, crowning. Uh, and so you're not a specialist in anything. You know, I think where the armor, I think, can be a specialist. I, I do agree uh, with, with Chad's assessment that for the most part, you know, you're the, as an armor, you're either gauging uh, and replacing or swapping parts. You know, you're diag you know, you're doing some diagnostics now, depending on how in depth you get, uh, you know, some of that stuff, uh, you know, I in a two day course, you could probably do some checkbox armor work. You know, where you can, you know, you know, if oh, if you experienced a failure to, you know, eject, you could, you know, possibly just change a whole bolt. You know, I mean, but the deeper you go into it, whenever you really start to conceptualize how the gun eats and breathes, I think that's where like some of your more talented armors, you know, separate themselves because then you're you're not just. Um, you know, you're you're not just a a specialist on that one platform. You, you can become a specialist, I guess, on the entire family, the entire you know the system, the, the AR family of weapons. And uh, you know, one of the things, yeah, last year I taught almost a thousand students, and uh, you know, you could tell some of the guys were there to get like their research for whatever state agency or whatever it was. You know, they were there to check a box, and then some guys were there at the edge of their seat taking, you know, fifty yeah. pages of notes. And I think that it's kind of what you're going to get out of it, what you've kind of put into it. And so, yeah, I mean, as far as the gunsmith stuff, man, people come to me all the time and they hand me a, a you know, I'll have a friend, you know, come in and say, like, Hey man, I can't get this lever action rifle to work. I'm like, ah, I, I'm not your guy, man. I'm, you know, that's just not my thing. But when it comes to the M4, I, that's, you know, do you have a paper clip? I can fix that right now. <laughs> That's all I need. Yeah. And and also, yeah, nothing's nothing against gunsmiths. We have friends that are gunsmiths. When I think gunsmith, the first name that comes to mind for me is Dave Laubert, just because I've been messing with revolvers so much recently. Uh, same with like uh, um, Joe Chambers. Joe Chambers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but 
yet different fields doing different things. So today we're talking about armors. And yeah, so I've been doing I've been doing armor stuff since oh four oh five, I think. Um working on an agency level kind of sucks. Because no one takes care of their guns and they don't listen. Add add lubrication. You need to this is way too dry. We're 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 working the action right now and you can hear that is dry. Why aren't you listening? And you're optic is dead you haven't changed batteries but that's another story so let's get into some of these some of these tools let's actually start with that that fix it stick thing what have you got are these something worthwhile and this is this episode is not brought to you by them this is my own personal curiosity because i like having tools i like having the ability to do stuff and if there's a tool that's going to do something a little better i'm going to want it so what do you guys what's your guys experience with those chad I want to hear your opinion. No, no pressure. Uh, I have some, ex- I have some experience with them. I, I don't have uh, anything negative to say about them at all. I think they're a very, uh, a very compact um, torque wrench, end pound torque wrench that you would, uh, you would keep in maybe uh, a mobile kit, a range bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have on your bench, but the reason that I don't use them uh, specifically, like at my student benches or at my bench, is because. Uh, I use the Wheeler wrenches, the fat wrenches. You can buy better inch pound torque wrenches than the Wheeler. But when I teach, I try to strike a balance. And this sounds funny if you've ever been in my class, because once you leave, you want to buy thousands of dollars worth of tools. Um, but I, I try to keep as much as I teach as approachable as possible. So I, when I teach about pinning a gas block, could you break out, you know, a, a $30,000 mill and do it? Absolutely. But I teach that you can do it with a, a cordless drill. Yeah. So the, the Wheeler fat wrenches I like because they're sort of available everywhere. Uh, they're somewhat affordable and they actually work. Um, this is not something they promote. And a lot of people get twisted up about this, but they can actually check your installation torque with what's referred to as breakaway torque. So if you set a Wheeler wrench at 50 inch pounds and uh, you want to know whether or not it's actually at 50 inch pounds, you can take that Wheeler wrench or another one and about five inch pounds over half value, that fastener will break away. So you can use that for inspections on things like carrier keys to see if someone installed things right, where otherwise you're sort of blindly trusting it. Um, you can't do an absolute test because that becomes destructive, but that's sort of why I use the Wheeler wrench, not because it's better than the fix at six, just a little more universal. And it gives me some extra troubleshooting features that the fix it stick wouldn't, but it's bulkier than the fix it stick. So there's a pro and con to both sides. That brings up an interesting aspect of this as well, because I do keep tools in my patrol truck and I keep, I definitely keep a bulk of my stuff at home and it is nice to have stuff available mobily. But my go-to stuff, if I have my choice, I'm going to go home and work on stuff. I would much rather have everything available and a a much more stable platform than, okay, it's just going to go on my lap. Mike? In the shop, every every bench has those Wheeler fat wrenches. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're just so handy for for everything. I mean, we we, um, that's kind of what we use. I don't, we don't really use the fix it six at, uh, at the shop. I have nothing against them. It's just, uh, you know, all of our benches are kind of outfitted the the same way, you know, yeah. but I have, but just to say, I have, I have nothing against them. I mean, it's no, not, no, yeah. but, and, and something to consider with this, the specific discussion is again, application. Are you at a, a, at a fixed position, a fixed place where you're working on stuff day in, day out, or is this your mobile set? So yeah. And I, and I suspect most people aren't going to be getting that, the, the lighter weight mobile. They don't need that mobility. They just need good tools. Mm-hmm. So yeah, when you're I, talking, weir- yeah. I weirded them out. <laughs> you it what? was the fir- first shot show I was ever at probably five, six years ago, you know, going around touching every trigger, touching every gun, wasn't all that impressed, came across the fix it stick stand in the middle of nowhere and sat there for like 30 minutes. And they were like, uh, what's your problem? I was like, dude, this thing is awesome. Um, so yeah, no, I love them, you know, to Chad's point and Mike's point, I wheeler is the way to go, but for mobile, it's, it's hard to beat. And I, I use them a lot for like on the soft goods side of stuff, like mounting stuff on belts, mounting stuff on, you oh. know, just anything. Cause they're just so universal They're I and mean, you can fit them in your pocket. I mean, I carried one for, I don't know, a little while there and then realized I wasn't using it enough. So 
you know, took it out, but yeah, no, they're awesome. I love them. Which specific set? Uh, it's one of their smaller sets. So it doesn't have any of the torque, um, application, but it's got the two cross beams and then you just put them together and then you've got the whole, you know, it snaps together in a little silicone case that has, I don't know, one, two, three, probably like six or eight bits together on either side. So you can carry a full bit, you know, whatever bits you want, full size bits, you know, torque, flat, whatever, Alan. Um, and you just have a full size screwdriver in your pocket. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's talk more about those wheelers then. Because I can see most people are going to want to have that fixed set of tools. So which wrenches are you specifically talking about? And this goes out we, to anyone. So we use like the, the, the fat wrenches a lot. And, you know, you have to think um, you can set, you know, it, you know, obviously you want things to be calibrated. You want things to be pretty accurate. But I mean, you know, whenever you're going to, a, 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 like Chad was saying, uh, gas key set screw you know we torque those to 58 inch pounds you know that's a torque to yield screw like the meaning that they that you're putting the maximum amount of torque on that fastener that you can uh you know for gas block set screws you know we torque those to 25 inch pounds uh you know like so you know if you look at scope mounts you know what you're you know you so like there, there's you can sit there and adjust that torque value on one tool change a bit and then just bang. And there's so many things, you know, you know, at least those three things for sure on a, you know, on a, on a rifle that you're going to be working on. Um, it's pretty handy to have. And, and this stuff's important. I mean, you can absolutely over torque. Uh, I think you can over torque, uh, you know, scope rings. It's very easy to, I think, over torque a, um, uh, a gas key set screw or it is, you know, or to under torque it. And also, people who take might take this for granted, but I think you can certainly over torque gas block set screws to where you're, you know, potentially causing some bore constriction. You know, you you mm. can. I mean, so if you're just going on there and in and, and becoming a you know gorilla about it, uh, your performance is going to be shit if your if your your technique was not very good and you didn't adhere to some of those values. And these values are there for a reason. And people didn't pull them out of their ass. I mean, they're, they're real. <laughs> you know? yeah. A question came up in chat. Um, Dan grabbed a Vortex torque wrench. Is the Wheeler superior in your guys' experience? I, or- I'm embarrassed to I, I'm embarrassed to admit this publicly, but here's the honest answer. We, I, I haven't really explored the full gamut, you know, yeah. of what's out there. You know, we, we, we kind of, I'm not saying we get institutionalized. It's just that we have stuff that's worked for us for a long time. And typically guys just, when we burn through tools. They just reorder, you know, I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. New stuff is constantly being introduced, hanging out with Chad. You're an expensive friend, my friend. <laughs> you know, like Chad's an expensive <laughs> friend. Like yeah, I got introduced to some pretty neat stuff. Uh, we're adopting for the shop, different fixturing, but honestly, I don't have that much experience with that vortex. Chad, do you? No, I, I don't recall ever messing with that one. Um, I think it looked very similar to the wheeler, if I remember correctly, but I, I might be having a senior moment. Um, and I try to experiment with stuff because I'm of the mindset that um, some companies can produce some pretty awesome tools if you don't give them a chance. So for years, uh, I, my favorite general purpose, not to break away from inch, inch pound wrenches, but my favorite general purpose armorist wrench was a Tapco. And I used to get so much crap for that. Yeah. They were like, oh my God, he doesn't know crap because he's recommended Tapco. Tapco makes crap. And I'm like, have you ever even messed with it? And and people You've said that for people years. Just lost, yes. Yeah, people lost their mind. And I think Mike loves them too. Um, I wanted to buy the company Tapco. And uh, well, I mean, I didn't want to buy the whole company. I just wanted the intellectual property to that fucking <laughs> wrench. And they weren't ready to part it out. I think uh, PSA, I think PSA owns them now, right? They're the company. But yeah, dude, that, so. that was the, yeah. I still have my original wrench. It's a Tapco, man, and it's uh, I love that thing. So we need. To, I I yeah. try to I try to stay up to date on on different tools that come out. So I guess you could say I, I'm I'm failing there because I like to share my experience with tools. I don't normally don't make recommendations on you know AR components. I just sort of call them as I see them. But yeah. when it comes to tools, I, I I really try to to give people as much information as possible when it comes to sort of the best value. And and I guess yes. I need to check the Vortex one out. Yeah, that that's the biggest crux with the Vortex is it's one ninety, it's the price point. Mm. That's a spicy I mean, meatball. If, well, yeah. I'll tell you what. I mean, if if I'll, I'll look into it, and if and if I can look into it, and, 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 and there's a compelling reason 
as to why it's better. I mean, we, we would certainly adopt it. That is one thing. When, when I come across something that is better, I mean, you know, there were cert, there were some fixturing tools that we recently came across that were just better than the the ways we were doing things. Made it made it easier. And they're expensive. Good, good tools, just like good rifles, aren't cheap. Um, you know, and it, it depends on what level of of work you're doing. I mean, if you're servicing, you know, a couple of rifles a year, you know, five rifles a year. Okay. Then, you know, perhaps, you know, that, you know, uh, but if you're working at the industrial level as a, you know, as an armor, or someone's paying you to work on guns or at the agency level where you have, you're working on a lot of guns, the right tools are going to make a difference. Um, I'll definitely check out the vortex wrench. If someone can send me a link to that, I want to go check it out. Yeah, I can, I can send a link to the chat real quick. Thanks. Cool. TJ has a good question. Checking torque wrench calibration. How often is that even being done? I mean, I mean, we're spot checking things fairly, you know, fairly often. Uh, the guys, you know, I don't, I don't know what the exact, I don't, I, I'll be honest. I don't know what our exact schedule is on that. Mm hmm well, I can tell you, Mike, that uh, when I was there, I saw a couple in the trash pile. Hmm. So I know you guys aren't using them when they're bad. No, no. I mean, I'm telling we at our level, we're burning through tools quite a bit. I mean, you burn through hammers. You know, you burn through everything. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it has a every tool has a service life. Um. So yeah, I check mine once every three months for the foot pound wrenches. And uh, about the same for the inch pound wrenches. If you're sending them out for calibration, um, depending on the cost of the torque wrench, you'll usually pay more than what the wrench costs. So for instance, the wheeler, if I were to send it out, I'm paying about $45, $50 per unit. I can buy a wheeler for that. Yeah. So I normally recommend people if they have, that's why I said like using the reverse torque check. If you have a newer wrench that has a little calibration sheet with it, you can sort of check your old one with it by using that sort of breakaway torque test. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, or you can torque one screw and then put the other wrench on there at the same value and see if it moves more. It'll tell you if it's over its value. It might not tell you if it's under. Um, but there are ways you can sort of poor man's cross check stuff. But I normally recommend it if you're going to use a wheeler in a professional capacity, just replace it once a year. Um, and maybe just give your old one to somebody who's sort of a hobbyist, right? Maybe it's not as important that it's 15 to 20% out of calibration. It's still going to be better than the Uga Duga method. Yeah. Cool. I mean, if you, if you do this at enough volume, you, you, you don't get attached to any of your tools. I mean, yeah. cause you're going to burn. I mean, I mean, you know, I don't, I haven't really seen a, you know, too much of a expiration date, you know, on a, on like some of those armors wrenches or certain stuff like that. But I mean, you're, uh, almost your punches you know like the nylon and brass heads on hammers um you know almost anything you're beating on with impact you know uh reaction rods we wear those out all the time uh i mean yeah. you'd be something you know you would look at a, like a piece of steel and you're wondering well no i mean you, you you wear out reaction rods uh probably once a year at least for once you know maybe even twice a year i mean you go through them pretty quick cool I'm, the, I'm of the opinion, though, that any person who turns screws or hits things with a hammer with a gun needs to have an inch-pound torque wrench. They must have it. If you're going to mount optics, uh, you, you're going to put stuff on there. Torque value is more consistent than uh, good and tight. <laughs> good stuff. So we've covered those. What's another piece of equipment that is absolutely mandatory on your bench? I've always, you know, I've always joked that my advice for how someone should buy a vice is mm -hmm. kind of like my advice for someone how you should buy a gun safe, and that is, you know, liberty. One... Oh wait, <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, <Topical>. Yeah. <laughs> no, but find find the find the one that you think is big, you know, is big enough for the job, and then buy the fucker uh, one size bigger than that, you know. Yeah. Um, being able to isolate stuff and really, really lock it in is a, is a big deal when you're trying to apply torque or you're trying to, you know, there's a lot of, you're going to use a vice a lot in armorers work. You're going to use us on M4 AR armorers work. You're going to use a vice a lot. 
and you know it's got to be mounted to something really really solid i mean you, you can't be lifting the bench off the ground if you're trying to put some torque on something I agree 100 percent good, yeah, what, good like, work bench good pad 50 percent of your job is on a bike minimum it's a, it's a good chunk yeah yep good chunk what you're doing i mean you know obviously barreling muzzle devices uh fixturing for castle nuts you know i mean all of that stuff is your own advice yeah well and then half the other jobs make it easier with the bike yeah well to to drive that home if you're holding something if you have grip strength to hold something in your hand and wrench something on torque values aren't going to matter because there's there's too many variables going on and your hand isn't going to be as solid as you think it is. Wrapping something in a towel and putting it between your legs is not a replacement for a vice. Just so you know, just, just need to throw that out there. Cause someone listening, I know I've done it, um, is currently doing it. What do you mean? Standing on your lower receiver as a, as that a vice? Too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to move. Mm. <laughs> Now, I remember having a conversation with Chad specifically about benches too. And I said, okay, so, so what are you using for your bench? Is there a, is there a commercial variant or a commercial something that you're using that's providing a, a good solid surface work surface? Chad, do you uh, remember? The ones your, that I, yeah. Yes. The ones that I use in class are, um, they're not available everywhere. They're through, through Sam's club yep. and it's called Seville classic S E V I L L E. I think there's another company that produces them under a different name and they cost a lot more, but the benches are, it's like a two inch bench top wood solid. I think they're six feet long and they're 200, 200 ish dollars. It, you, you, you could source the material just to build a basic bench and spend more. Um, they're pretty darn solid. My only thing is I would say to bolt them to something so they don't move. They're, they're not super heavy beyond the workspace, you know, surface. Uh, but they're really nice that you can buy like alternatives for like storage, like tuckable tool, tool carts that go underneath the bench. Uh, they make some other stuff, but the, the benches are fantastic. We've used them now, uh, for seven years in classes and never had a problem from one. Um, I use one when I taught my classes in different locations. I attach wheels to it and sort of cart it out like a gurney. Um, and again, it worked great. So um, there could be other options, but that's the ones that I found through a lot of digging and research. And uh, it's it's not a bad price. Two, $200-ish dollars is pretty good for a workbench. And I just saw chat and Nick basically asked, is there a good <laughs> solid table recommendation? Or is it worth making a fab table? Josh, what are you doing? I I have a old workbench I bought from a it was a old electronic lab that went out of business, so it's it's fancy. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just drilled some holes in it and mounted a vise to it. I'm good to yeah. go. Yeah. Mike, you're do you? I'm I'm guessing you have a, a setup at home. How much does it differ from stuff at work? Uh, my setup at home is almost a clone of the yeah. stuff that we have at the, you know, at work. I mean, we, we built these benches that are very, very solid, heavy work benches the, at work. Our benches are bolted to each other, you know, in rows and columns, you know, and then to the wall and then, you know, so, I mean, but we're also doing this at like an industrial level, you know, we're yes. not, we're not just, you know, like working on guns that are coming in. I mean, we're, we're a, a production shop, so that might be overkill. For what somebody needs i will say this that the the workbench is 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 one of the most important tools you're going to have right so if you're having to deliver impact to something and your work surface is giving and it's absorbing that impact that you're meaning for something specific the bench is fighting you you know and, and it, so i mean it, it cannot give yeah. another thing too is like the height of the bench i've noticed just from having watched dudes work for nine years on guns if that bench is too low and you're hunched over, you know, you're going to see people exhaust faster. Uh, you know, you wear out and, you know, you just, you know, it's, it, that's an uncomfortable way to work. If the bench is too high, you can't deliver adequate torque to stuff. It's very hard to torque something up here as opposed to being able to use your, you know, use your body. So having that workbench being very, very solid at the right height, you know, and I think even the depth of it too, right. I mean, you know, you want to give yourself enough room to do, do what you got to do um 
that's important. So I mean, putting some thought into that. Uh, I, it, when I teach armorers classes and we're on the road, we're using folding tables. I guarantee you, like the assembly of that lower or whatever, if you're driving roll pins or something, it's a lot harder on that plastic table than it is on a good bench, you know? Cool. Um, what other tools are mandatory that you guys can think of for your benches to work on ARs? As an armor. I like wood handle screwdrivers. You know, the screwdrivers and wood handles seem to get a better grip on them, better purchase when your hands are, you know, got a bunch of oil and lube and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I can, I can go down the entire list of every tool we have. I mean, I just, you know, I don't know. Uh, we, as we can take turns, go around the circle here. Chad, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> I wrote down some stuff. I'll, I'll just name off like two or three things and then let you guys expand on it. Um, one of the things that I find is extremely useful is a bore scope. Mm. Um, they used to be really pricey. Um, you can get a flexible bore scope from like Amazon for $50. Um, mm -hmm. They're they're really good for looking at stuff. The downside to bore scopes is um, they sort of open people's eyes to how terrible something machine looks under a magnifying glass, if you will. And they expect everything to be perfect. Um, I try to teach that it's good for sort of looking at something that may not quite be right. And then learning from that. Um, it's not a whole lot different than someone who's not trained uh, medically to look at like an x-ray or some type of body scan and say, oh, yeah, well, I know what's wrong with them. It's not a whole lot different than with a gun. Uh, but they can be really good at looking at things that you might not be able to get a peek at. Um, even for things like the the tip of a firing pin, a borescope is a great tool because if the firing pin has some damage, maybe you don't have good eyesight, the borescope will see that it's pitted or chipped or corroded. Um, and it's just a really good tool. And it used to be expensive. And since they've come down in cost and more affordable, I think they are a necessity whether it's for pistols, rifles, whatever. Uh, I'll expand on what Mike said with a with a screwdriver set. You need a good screwdriver set. I was taught as a gunsmith to never booger up fasteners. Uh, so make sure that you have bits that fit what you're trying to work on. Make sure they seat all the way. And if you met some, mess up something, then you need to make it right. And then, of course, uh, punches. Mike sort of covered that, too. I like to go with specific companies that make punches for certain firearms because I group my punches in an organizer. So if I'm working on a Glock, I only have Glock tools in front of me. If I'm working on an AR, I only have AR tools in front of me. That way I don't grab the wrong punch or the wrong roll pin holder and end up trying to drive something into the wrong place. So that, that's just my way of thinking about it. Um, I use obsidian arm punches at my benches because they have a lifetime warranty. And if they break them, I reach out to Obsidian and they replace it, no questions asked. So it's a, it's a pretty good thing, even though I use them in a professional capacity. Um, but those are the things that I wanted to throw out there. Cool. Yeah, and obviously a foot pound torque wrench. Mike? So going back to what Chad said, I thought it was interesting. That board scope, we use board scopes, you know, quite a bit. And especially whenever stuff is coming back in, you know, from service and stuff like that, you know, we, we've had guns at machine gun rental ranges for a couple of years. And so it's kind of neat to see what's going on in there after that level of destructive firing schedule. Uh, you know, or we you know we still do some guns, not gunsmith, and we still do service some other weapons for certain entities in and around San Antonio for its friends and stuff. They, you know, that bring in guns that are not Sons of Liberty guns. We still service them on occasion. That's, we don't, don't really have the bandwidth to do that these days. But I will tell you, just from some of the stuff that we've been doing more and more at Sons of Liberty, as far as like getting into the precision game, some of the the you know doing some of the chambering uh, in house things like that. When you start really looking at bores through a bore scope, it's incredible that something can look uh, not good. Something can look like it's got chatter or something can look like it's not right. But then you go shoot the thing and, you know, it's grouping, you know, you know incredibly. Um, I think what Chad's saying is exactly right. Like, you know, if you – bore scopes for us whenever we're inspecting that, like they help a lot when you're inspecting corrosion or you're inspecting pitting – 
you're inspecting things like that, right? Or, you know, you're looking at a gas port that's uh, like, you know, stripping parts of the jacket as it's passing that port. There's some type of something going on there. But uh, oddly enough, the, I mean, and we've looked, we've tried every way to, you know, look at the concentricity of chambers and look at, you know, bore diameter. A bore scope's not going to tell you some of that. So by looking down a bore scope, I think it'd be hard to tell if like, oh, hey, this gun uh, is going to be inherently accurate or not. Because something that looks kind of shitty on the scope doesn't always, the, the target doesn't lie. You know, you have to validate some of that. Some of the stuff that looks beautiful doesn't do too well. Um, but yeah, I do agree that a bore scope is important <laughs> because, you know, there are some, there are some issues that will jump out at you pretty quick. You know, also looking at like, you know, throat erosion and stuff without having to actually take the entire thing a part if you want to see what's going on in there. No, I'm sorry, you know, throat and then also gas port erosion like that. You could look at some of that stuff and it make quick work of it. One of the things I really liked, and that kind of goes with the idea of the of the bore scope, even if you don't need them, a pair of readers purely for magnification to see things. So I actually have to use these on occasion, even when I'm not working on guns. But when it does come to working on guns, it sure is nice to be able to see even better. Uh, especially for anything that's going to be preci precise, precision, tiny. Um, it makes working on guns considerably more pleasant in my experience. Yeah, and good lighting. I mean, you know, good you lighting. Want, yes. You, want, you know, you want, you yeah. want good lighting too. Uh, you know, for us, you know, obviously you want some, you want some type of mat to work on um, and something to put down. So you don't, uh, you're not marring shit and it's just a little bit easier to work on. Yep. Um, man, a good armorer's hammer. There, there's actually several. There's several hammers that we use quite a bit, like the Brownells hammer that has the uh, brass head and the nylon head that can be replaced. Again, I like the fact that they can be replaced because you do wear down those. I mean, you do you know wear down those parts. Uh, I like the hammer to have a little bit of mass, so the tool is doing some of the work for you whenever you're you know driving something or hitting it. Uh, sometimes a big ass mallet is what you need, you know, rawhide or, or big rubber mallet. Sometimes a big ass hammer is the answer. Um, there's a couple of, there you go. I mean, like that, that is something that we reach for quite often. Um, you know, like, like the way our rails fit onto a barrel nut. I mean, we're tapping those on a lot of times because that, that fit is so snug. And people, it's, it's funny to watch novices or like, it's funny to watch students work on guns for the first time because they're like they're baby and stuff so much they're so afraid to like you know and then you watch a gunsmith or you want or an armor that's done it you know a thousand times and it's uh it's not always pretty to watch but that's the technique sometimes you know sometimes you got to convince something to do something <laughs> you know I agree. Check. Big, big ham, big hammer is important, and I like uh, having rubber mallets and plastic mallets. Sometimes you got to hit stuff hard, and you don't want to mar the surface. So, even if it's a cheapo Harbor Freight, a good plastic or rubber hammer. Yep. So, a question came up, and it looked, Josh actually intercepted it. Uh, magnetic cups. Josh, your feedback. Uh, Obviously, this comes from Chad, so I'm not the pro <laughs> here, but magnetizing small components is a nightmare's dream. <laughs> you, you definitely want to, that's actually one of the big checks that Chad does specifically with, you know, the BCG is we go through and we check each component for magnetism, because if any of those components are magnetized as you're shooting, if there's any kind of trace metals in the, you know, the ammo itself and the, the powder and anything like that, it's going to be attracted. So let's take the worst case scenario, your firing pins magnetized. All of that, it's, it's all going to be attracted to your firing pin. Now your gun's not firing, and you don't know why. And it's a hard, I mean, that gun is down, 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 until you can demagnetize that that firing pin. Good luck finding that in the field. Yeah. That's even why I'm somewhat leery on using, personally, I, you know, cause I use a, uh, Snapco like ratchet, you know, screwdriver for the most of my stuff. But even then I'm very careful to pull all the bits out. So as a bit doesn't stay in it and I don't know, I'm maybe I'm just being over anal about that, but I really don't even want my bits to get magnetized.
So Chad, when it comes to re- yeah. reciprocating parts, keep them, keep them demagnetized. No, that, make, that makes great sense. Uh, another question from chat. Is there a specific vice that you guys recommend? I think it's uh it's cool to short a shop around on like Facebook marketplace or like mm. uh, yard sales and find like a really nice old classic vice and learn a little bit of uh, a little bit of restoration. Oh, that's Maybe cool. It's a little rusty, figure out how to, you know, get the corrosion off it, rebuild it and sort of make it like a family heirloom if you can. Um, otherwise just get like a, a six inch vice. Um, some people get away with a Harbor freight one. Um, but if you're really muscling on them, they might not last long. Uh, Yoast oh. has some entry level ones. Most, most vices that aren't going to cost you like five, $600 are probably going to be Chinese made anyway. Um, but yeah, find, find an old vice, you know, something that's, uh, got some, some, uh, some use on it, some character and, uh, bring it back to life. That's my advice. That's cool. About the vice. <laughs> advice about the vice. Mike, no, that's no, I, I, I like it, man. That's kind of, yeah. A, a good vice isn't cheap you know like a, a really good vice is not cheap i mean it's a pretty it's a pretty decent investment um but you know they last long enough to become heirlooms right if you buy a good one uh the harbor freight ones we've seen them snap i mean, I, I mean actually it's kind of it's it's a it's a real sight to see whenever something that giant breaks you know and snaps and falls to the ground um so yeah i would you know, find a good american made vice somewhere you you have your vice fail one time with a you know uh, a fifteen hundred dollar upper receiver in it and it hits the floor if you don't have the right padding and uh, it could wreck some really expensive stuff so it's it's worthwhile if you have the funding for it. No, that's cool. More tools. Anything else you guys can think of? Um, I got big, a couple things on the list. Go ahead, guys. Josh? I'm a big fan of the uh, forward control uh, wrench adapters, all the things that go on your torque wrench for, you know, castle nuts, all that kind of stuff. Granted, I use a lot of the forward control. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it sticks out. The castle nut sticks out, so you can't get three teeth on it. So you got to use their their specific wrench for the two teeth. Um, of course, they just came out with the A5 castle uh, nut which extends out even further, which is really cool. So you don't have to deal with that anymore, but yeah, just buying, just spending a little bit of money on some, some good components for actually wrenching on things. That I'm really a big, big one on that. Cause you see those things blow out. I mean, you, you could put a single barrel nut on and I've had those stupid things break from the manufacturer, the ones that they include. I mean, I would definitely suggest having, you know, a lot of a lot of uh a lot of rails these days have proprietary barrel nuts and uh you know you you have to have the right wrench to work on that barrel nut correctly and so having you know a good span of that kind of stuff i mean obviously you know if you're working in a, an agency and there's several different guns in inventory you, you know you should probably have a you know the the appropriate barrel nut wrench for each rail you might find mm-hmm. obviously you know if you're working on usgi stuff that's convenient because there's several tools for that but um you know if you're just going to try to put a strap wrench on something or you know a crow's foot on something that's proprietary you're going to destroy it or you're going to damage it and uh you know you got to be cognizant of that to be cognizant of the materials you know if you're using uh you know some some barrels ship with aluminum wrenches because you know you're you're using it on like a kind of a thinner aluminum nut you know you put a steel wrench on there a steel crow's foot or some you know pipe wrench or whatever you yeah you know like you're going to destroy that part you know and it's something like in an area that critical it, again you're going to see performance results i mean technique technique is as important as the component itself and having the right tool to not destroy something is is pretty important too you know so i mean again if you if, if you've this is something that i i see i talk about in my classes if if you've lost a wrench, unless you have like the ability to maybe fabricate one, um, then you need to call the manufacturer and, and seek that. You know, stop the project, mm-hmm. stop what you're working on, 
and go try to, you know, find that wrench and, and don't touch the project until you have the right tool. A lot of guys get impatient and they try to, you know, do again, if you're in a machine shop and you can fabricate that tool, okay, then that's clearly, you know, you can make whatever you want. If you're in your garage and you don't have that capacity, stop and call the manufacturer and get a wrench, you know? That's good advice. This is one of those things. It kind of touches on some other stuff where I call it the ah, fuck it factor. Yeah. And the, the, the ah, fuck it factor is, you know, if you're working in your garage on something and you uh, only have one of it, like, you know, you only have one, you know, detent spring, you know, for a takedown pin or something like that. Right. And you kink it. If you only have one, a lot of times it's like, ah, fuck it. You know, and you're just going to try to make that bad spring work. Uh, or, you know, same thing with, if you can't get a barrel nut uh, to time up right or whatever, and you just, you only have one of them, I guess, aside from tools, one of the most important things you can have as an armor is extra parts. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's uh, actually the next topic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll stay on tools for a little bit, but yeah, I mean, like, again, don't find yours. Like, again, if you, if you need us like for muzzle devices, like for certain muzzle devices, they have proprietary wrenches for that device. And if you don't have that wrench and you try to do it some other way, there's a good chance you're going to mess it up. And I, I mean, I would, again, stop the project, get the right tool. And it's funny, you mentioned strap wrench, strap wrenches, which I forgot, which I purchased 15 years ago to work on ARs because I don't have the right tools. But you know what? That strap wrench, that's going to do the job wrong. <laughs> yeah i mean you know i mean again just yeah the specific punches good hammers vices benches bench blocks vice blocks right you want good yeah. vice blocks to isolate mm-hmm. something um you know we use pin gauges i mean I, I think it's good to have at least a, a set of pin gauges laying around you know um yeah, that's probably not a, the worst idea in the world um uh, Let's see. I'm, I'm trying to like, like go through the whole the. You see the you see those brown nails in out things for the 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 front sight base. We 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 don't always use those just for that, but like that's we usually every bench at least has one of those, you know, for knocking those front sight bases in and out, and they are very helpful unless you're working on a Smith and Wesson. Because they drill the fucking pins backwards. I don't understand. I don't understand. What is it, Chad? Left to right, right? For the muzzle, you know, yep. industry standard. I'm having a brain fart. I think you're right. For some reason, Smith & Wesson was doing it, like, right to left. And then, like, once yeah, they you do. Visual- they, they, yeah. They right. flipped it. <laughs> yeah. Ask me how I know that. Like, ask me how the first time I figured that out. You know? <laughs> I did it. Um, I got a couple more on the list. You guys want me to blow through them and then we'll, yeah. uh, we'll touch on them. Yeah. Um, so I have a uh, protrusion gauge for an AR. I believe it's pretty important. You can get what they call friction gauges. You can use a, a, a set of calipers to do it. There's lots of ways to do it, but fire pin protrusion. Um, I like the Mark Brown custom tools that you can get from Brownells that make a gas tube wrench to get a stuck gas tube out. It grabs the gas tube without damaging it, and then they make a gas tube gauge, which can gauge the, I call it the flange that the care key telescopes over. If that gets undersized or worn, um, it can cause cycling issues or bolt lock open on last round issues. Um, staking punches for your castle nut, several types. Some people get tribal about which one's the right one, but something that's pointed. Um, are you guys working on punches, Mike, for that? Oh, he, he disappeared. Away. Yeah. He knew you were going to ask that question. That's all right. Uh, gas tube bender. Um, Ned Christensen. So you can, from so you can make a you can make a pigtail. Is that? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if you got to tweak that gas tube, if it isn't quite straight, uh, instead of sticking like a, a big flat blade screwdriver in your receiver and start, you know, trashing the inside up, it bends it without, you know, burring anything. You just brought um, up Ned. It, yep, uh, Ned and I and I still and I have at least one Moax. Got to have a Moax. Yeah. You're going to work on ARs. You got to have a way to stake, and it's a great tool to do it nice and clean. Brown also makes one. 
Um, I like a lot of stuff Brownells does, but I think that they they could have done a better job with the staking tool that Brownells makes. Doesn't quite do a clean stake. It'll work, <clears throat> but not a, qu a clean stake. Um, bolt vice. So if you got to change your ejector, I can do it without a vice. Uh, but it's it's called a bolt vice, little tiny fixture. Uh, yeah. Several companies make them. Um, let's see. Uh, a trigger guard press is smart. Some people will use mm. a hammer and punch, but if you've ever had the uh, the ears break the ear, off the yep, receiver, yep. <laughs> you'll, you'll regret it. Little Crow Gunworks makes a, a press for that, and Wheeler makes a copy of the Little Crow Gunworks. Um, what else do I have here? Um, something to knock your pin in for your gas block. So like a little you know fixture that holds your gas block when you're driving mm -hmm. in the roll pin. That doesn't hurt um suppressor alignment rod if you have a suppressor or you work on suppressors um laser thermometer i think that's pretty important for diagnostic a lot of people don't think about it but if uh you're testing something uh, or you're trying to remove something using a laser thermometer can tell you whether or not you've reached a certain temperature that can give you some feedback some diagnostic information so if I'm trying to remove a fastener and I heat it up to 500 degrees, well, most Loctite breaks down at 500 degrees. So if the fastener is 500 degrees and it's still not moving, it's probably not Loctite, right? So heating more ain't going to help you. It's probably rock set or it's just, you know, it's seized up. But a laser thermometer is a, a pretty important tool on my bench. Um, and then the right chemicals, right? What do you assemble stuff with? The right thread lockers, uh, the right assembly greases, uh, touch-up stuff like aluminum black and cold blue, all very important stuff. Wait, so you're not just using permanent marker? <laughs> Spray paint in it, man. There you go. You, you scratch it, you got to Cerakote the whole gun, Matt. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, but those were some high points on my list. Mike had mentioned things like fixtures. Um, those always make your job easier. Yeah. Um, things that hold like the receiver extension and the lower while you're torquing the castle nut, those things are great. Um, can you get by without them? Absolutely. But it takes more technique and usually technique, uh, means that you already know what you're doing. So you probably don't need advice on what tool to use. So to me, one of the, one of the fun aspects of this specific topic is it's hopefully it's providing a shortcut for people so they don't have to make the same mistakes I personally have made because it's funny how many things that have been brought up. Yep. Been there. Yep. Did that. That was stupid. Yep. Shouldn't have done that. And that, yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a, a motivation also behind the whole primary and secondary thing. Just learn from our damn mistakes. Don't do the same things that we did. Waste your own time, your own money. Just do things right. The first time I had walked yep. away for a second. And as I was walking away, I was, I was hearing a, a discussion about the Moax. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a, a pretty well-known rifle manufacturer that was that did like a, a an installation or did a how to stake a carrier key uh, video, and they had like the carrier uh, you know locked into a vice, and they were using a punch and laterally smacking it, you know, smacking the carrier key to stay you know from the sides like like it, the way in which a Moax would you know, uh, displace that material to engage that fastener. They were doing it with impact with the wrench or with a, with a hammer and a, and a, like a chisel. And this is a very well-known AR manufacturer. And I, I remember looking at that thinking like, that's not, that's not how those fasteners were meant to, <laughs> that's not the kind of impact that they were meant to, you know, withstand. And I, and I, and I, I couldn't think of like, and this was their how to video, like instructional. And I started wondering like, well, how many, how many thousands of broken fat thousands of broken fasteners must be out there? That's not something you can always just visually inspect. A lot of times you don't realize that's a problem for you until you know, the gun starts short stroking and then eventually just fails. So like a Moax tool. Now this depends again on, on how involved you are. Like if we're talking about agency work, right? Like I know, you know, like we're talking about garage and agency stuff, you know, some agencies might not want people rekeying carriers. I think it's a good thing to learn how to do. We certainly teach it in class, you know, the, the proper torque value, that kind of stuff. Use the use of a Moax. Moax tool is a good thing to have. Uh, but 
that might be more involved than some people want to get. You know, I don't know. Well, that's why I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to temper some of my answers onto like, you know, like what kind of fixture do you need to install a front sight base? Well, that might not be something you want to do in your garage. You know, like you know, if you you installing a front yeah. sight base in your garage, might not be where you want to go with that. You know what I mean? Like, well, if we go back 15, 20 years, what's what were the big things? And it was staking the keys, and and inspect and inspect and inspect and look at your look at your uh, bolt carrier groups. And okay, what kind of fastener uh, is it staked properly? And those were big things to consider. And when you'd go to, when you'd look at buddies or even working for an agency, look at all the, uh, all the bolt carrier groups on your agency rifles and go, Oh shit, all these need to get staked. And so I have seen the bar raised across. It's, it, absolutely. It has raised. And I think it's because years. it's not discussed as much. Well, I mean, no, I mean like enough people started paying attention to at least some of these, like, you know, I think pretty significant inspection points. And, you know, you post your new bolt carrier group online that's got YFS fasteners and it you know, looks like some homeless guy chewed on it instead of yep. it being staked correctly. Um, you know, like he got called out pretty quick. It's amazing. I mean, just just in the last just since I started working on guns till now, like that, that one thing I can tell you has gotten dramatically better. Yes. Now, castle nuts still suck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless you're knights. <laughs> there you go. Unless you're knights. Did y'all, did y'all talk about these real avid kits yet? No. No, we so, were waiting for you. No. <laughs> so I've been seeing these things come through my class. Every class, there's at least four or five of these real avid kits. And I'll be honest, some of those little kit things, they're pretty intuitive. Not for, for garage use, home use kind of stuff. Um, I was surprised. I mean, they have like this one block that I thought was kind of neat. It's something that, you know, if I was tinkering in my, in my house, I wish I would have had 15 years ago when I started. Right. You know, but, um, they have like an ejector replacement tool. Now, is it robust? Is it going to stand up to thousands of uses? Probably not. But if you have to change one ejector or five ejectors, it's certainly, I think adequate. Um, you know, the, like the, 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 pivot pin installation tool the way we were always taught with Larson you know we 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 where we still teach it is with that pivot pin installation tool that has the hole for the yeah. for the detent and spring and, and they have some other little devices that I thought you know that makes it pretty easy just the evolution of like home based tools that did not exist when I started you know have you if you messed with these Chad yeah I, I have the real avid uh pivot pivot pin detent install tool at every bench Mm -hmm. um, I show like four, four different ways to do it. You know, the one way you're talking about with the classic tool, right. I teach using like a magnet. Um, I try to give people different, you know, methods so they can decide what they can do best. Um, but the real avid tool, I think it's like $12 if you buy it online someplace without shipping. And I tell people, you know, you, you, you lose, if you don't have spare parts, like you recommended, you lose one pivot pin spring and detent. And you order that one item from an online retailer, you just paid for that tool, right? With the shipping. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. You know, you just paid for the tool. So just buy the tool and use it. I mean, it's plastic. Nobody's broken one yet, but I think it's a, it's a great little tool. And a lot of the real avid stuff isn't bad. I would just say it's not, um, it's not professional level. If, it, if that's the proper word, it's a good tool for moderate use. Yeah, for my like I said, if you're if you're messing around at home in the garage kind of thing, some of that real avid stuff is I've seen is I wish I would have thought of it. You know, I wish I would have thought of it and packaged it and I bet the you know, um obviously like for any kind of serious use, it's not gonna it's not gonna last very long, but I mean how many ejector roll pins has the average person changed? Well, for uh pivot pin replacement or assembly i use the credit card trick <laughs> put the spring in apply pressure downward and then just everything it works i thought there was going to be a joke in there matt where you no. said that you lose parts and you just whip out the credit card and buy more well there's that too <laughs> oh okay what about also a magnet a magnet on a stick to pick up all the stuff that you can't quite see you notice how clean your room is 
No, nobody. We here chose has light colored floors in the shop just so you could find parts. That's he's got a point. No, nobody here has suggested channel locks for the uh, for the uh, bolt catch roll pin yet, right? Thank God. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a couple things uh, came up in chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Why are there different headspace uh, go no go gauges that seem to have slightly different dimensions for the same caliber? Shouldn't there be like a universal spec? Are there thing are there specific ones that should be avoided? <laughs> Chad, this, is, Chad, this is this is this is yours, bro. I'm sorry. The way he just he just kind of smiles in the camera. That's why he does um, his own. Um, when it comes to two, two, three, and five, five, six, the the industry, uh, I think, unfortunately, um, uses some uh, some dated information. Is the nicest way I can put it. Most companies who make a go ahead space gauge will say that the one point four six. 36 dimension gauge is universal between 223 Remington and 556. But if you actually look at the technical data package, the gauge they use, the go ahead space spec is 1.4646. So 556 is 14646 for go. 223 is 14636. And most people are like, big deal. We're talking about 0 .001. If you consider different weapon systems, and uh, let's just use 5.56, for example, a belt-fed 5.56 assault, um, the headspace spec is more forgiving when it comes to the reject dimension. And even for the go dimension, it can be longer. And uh, what I teach in classes is the reason that a gun that is belt-fed can have a longer headspace spec before it rejects it's because belt-fed weapons have a higher operating temperature under use. And if you get down to the technical aspects, headspace actually shrinks when the gun gets hot. The chamber expands, headspace gets shorter. So if you have a gun that's right on the verge of having short headspace when it's normal temperature, when it gets hot, things have trouble going into the chamber and for the bolt to lock up. So it's really important for it to have that bare minimum spec depending on the use. So I tell people, if you have a defensive or a fighting gun and it's 556, it better close on a 14646 gauge. If it's a you know paper puncher, a bare minimum, it must close on the 14636. Who makes the 14636? Everyone. Who makes the 14646? One company, Forrester. Unless you pay a company to custom grind it, Forrester 14646 SP is the part number. That's the gauge you want to get. And that's also just suggest, on top of his head. I'd also <laughs> suggest learning learning how to use the gauge. That's kind of important too. You know, some some gauge use is, is by feel. You know, some some other things. You know, I mean, some other stuff that you see. We've had customers call and you know ask about the headspace issues and the the gauge that they're using is, requires the disassembly of a bolt, and they're trying to you know gauge something without having you know taken. Yeah, you know, follow the instructions on the thing. So if you're going to invest in gauges, I would invest in some knowledge on how to actually use them. Yep. Just jamming a headspace gauge in an AR between the extractor, possibly damaging the gauge, the ejector loading the gauge. Um, the ejector itself will try to push the headspace gauge off to the right side of the gun when you're opening the bolt back up. And that's basically dragging the tapered edge of the gauge, the precision ground part, against the chamber and the barrel extension on the right side, which can scratch it, which can mess it up. You're taking a precision instrument and dropping it into something. You want to make sure that it's clean, and you want to make sure there's nothing that's going to scrape or damage it. So disassembling the bolt, pretty important in my experience. I modify my gauges so I don't have to do that because um, I can. And it makes things a lot easier. If I have to inspect 40, 50 weapons, I can check headspace on all of them in like 10 minutes. Or if I had to take the ejectors out, take a whole day, even with skill. So, and then, you know, you look at some of the Deltronic gauges and stuff for bores and other, you know, things. 
you, you kind of have to know what it feels like. I mean, because it's not necessarily like just a, a go or no go, or it's not just something that's not going to fit. Or it, I mean, you're having to almost be able to feel some of the resistance in that as you're pushing some of these things through there. So, um, again, you know, even on the headspace case, there there is a bit of feel required to it, you know. One of our regular Absolutely. listeners just uh, pointed out also, don't don't use crocheting tools for gun stuff. That's good insight right there. Well, who, who owns the crochet tools? I'm sure that whoever owns them isn't going to be happy that you're using them oh, as scraping and prying tools. She, she owns them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dare use my wife's crocheting tools uh, for, for gun work. She might use my gun stuff for, for crocheting, yes. but yeah. not vice versa. Do you guys prefer digital or analog uh, torque stuff? Screwdrivers and wrenches. For the wrenches, uh, for the inch pound one, I like the 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 analog one, the click wrenches. Uh, when it comes to foot pound wrenches, I have one of each type at every bench. So I have a beam wrench, a click wrench and a digital wrench. And I talk about the pros and cons of all of them. If you can only have one foot pound wrench and uh, Mike would probably agree with me on this, I'd rather have the beam type. And the reason being is generally you can't mess a beam type up unless you physically damage it. So if you have to sort of work something back and forth, you can do a beam wrench like that and not mess it up where you really don't want to be Herculean on a click or a digital wrench in reverse, trying to break something free. I recently so, posted a, sorry, go ahead. Good. No, you're, you're you're fine, Mike. And and I think I even chimed up on that. People are like, well, they're, you're using the wrench all wrong. And it's like, if you mess up a beam wrench by seasoning a barrel nut, um, you're doing something, right? You really, like, yeah. it's not possible in my experience. So at bare minimum, um, and I've seen that, Mike, they use those in the classes. And it makes sense because it's, number one, the most affordable wrench you're going to get. And it's really hard to stupid it up. So it's a good thing to teach on where the digital wrenches, they can get really pricey. And a lot of people are like, well, why would I buy that? I'm not building engines or working on aircraft. Okay, fine. Don't buy it. But a, a beam wrench is a bare minimum in my world. Yeah. We we have we have like several of us. So on the inch pound stuff, like again, our stuff, is, uh, like the wheeler is the analog. We do have digital wrenches for foot pounds. We also do use the uh, beam wrenches quite a bit. And I had posted a video recently of we were building a very large contract of guns. And I was kind of showing how that, what that looks like. How do you get through that many guns? And I, it was a video of Dylan doing this on Instagram. And the comments I was getting online was that guy doesn't know how to use a wrench. I'm like, I, I, I promise you that guy does. You know, I, I, I promise you Dylan knows how to use, use a wrench. And what it was, was, you know, we were seasoning barrel nuts right you know you tighten loose and tighten loose and tighten loose and three times you're seasoning that, that barrel nut beam wrenches are great for that and also you know like for time like that like that is the most efficient way to put the correct torque value on something and get through that job without cutting any corners that is like for the the economy of time that is how you do it you know now i i've, I've again i've seen videos of other shops doing other things and they're not even putting torque value in it. It's just, it's a good and tight kind of thing. It's certainly not seasoning anything, but if you're having to service a lot of different guns, if you're like, there are times whenever, you know, a unit or, a, you know, small arms repair guys or an agency or whatever, if you're having to rebarrel a few hundred guns, you know, uh, like that's, you know, you're not, there, again, there's an economy of time. You can still do that in an efficient way without, uh, you know, spending, you know, six months on it, a, a beam wrench makes a lot of sense in that application. In my opinion, there are some times where something else might be appropriate, but, um, yeah, <laughs> those comments were pretty funny, Chad. I, I, I thought, I, thank you for chiming in. It was my pleasure. They, they even talk about the, the adapter itself, right? They were like, well, he's using it in line and that's the wrong way to use it. And what people don't realize about, like, uh, according it, to the, you know, like, yeah, they'll, they'll bring up all actually, this stuff, like, actually, sir, and they'll, <laughs> you know, 
they'll they'll break out their fedora and they're like, you know, actually, and I'm like, come on, if you look at the 23 MP uh, military technical books, they'll actually show they have drawings of stuff. Not only do they write it out, but they draw it out. And they're using the military adapter to tighten the barrel nut and it's used straight in line. And people are like, well, why does the manual show how to use a torque wrench wrong? Because normally you got to do it like 90 degrees, right? And it's because that particular tool was used when they listed that torque value range, right? So if the range is 30 to 80, using that wrench straight in line, the value is 30 to 80 using that wrench in line. And it's usually about a two inch offset on a military adapter if you buy one of the GI type. So my general rule is if you're using a commercial armorer's wrench and it's less than a couple inches of offset between what you're tightening, and where the torque wrench locks in, it's not gonna hurt anything using an inline. But if there's like a 10 inch offset, you're probably gonna cause bad values to pop up. So if, you don't, if you're not aware of that, I mean, just a two inch offset, I remember doing the math watching Mike's video. I think it was like between five and seven foot pounds maximum, depending on calibration of the wrench. And what are you guys chasing, 50? Yeah, you know, well, on on that one, you're you're looking for between sixty to sixty five, but it, 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 it the math was actually the you know four four foot pounds. Okay, but whenever, four foot but, pounds. You know, but when, but it's whenever, a big deal. <laughs> well, but yeah, but also, but whenever you have somebody that's cognizant of that, you know, so you kind of know what your, you know, what your targets are. Again, you know, knowing how to use the tool is is important. <laughs> I mean, I've had the, the same people go after me for using the Wheeler wrench in reverse. Like, you're going to wreck that wrench. I mean, I've I've used this wrench like this for years. It, it works in this capacity. It's not marketed for it, but that little Wheeler fat wrench will tell you if a screw is installed right based on breakaway torque. If you use it all the time that way, it will reduce the life of the wrench. It will cause the wrench to be less less calibrated over time, but I'm aware of that. But it's also one of the cheapest ways to check something without destroying it or without redoing it. So I have a method for it. Some people can walk up and take a, a carrier key and put a bit driver on it and sort of torque it and see if it was tight. Will Larson could do that, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Will could just walk up and loosen it. Well, I can't teach that to somebody. That, that's something that takes skill and experience. But a torque wrench can do it. So I can tell tell somebody set a wrench to this and if it does something then you've achieved what a skilled person can do without having the skill because the tool's doing it so torque wrench is really really important i think we keep talking about it but i yeah, don't think people there's a reason it. a lot of people good and tight cool and if you use a torque wrench enough you can feel when it's not right like if you use it all the time and yeah. things wrong with the wrench i'm like wait a minute let me stop what i'm doing and go grab another wrench and check this and sure enough, nine times out of 10, I felt the wrench being off before anything bad happened. Well, it's just like the recoil impulse on an empty mag versus a loaded mag. Yeah. If yep. you know what you're feeling, yeah, there's a difference. I mean, you can hear it. Like I, I remember I used to sit outside the shop during test fire. And after a couple of years of that I can, I would walk back in there and be like, like the thing didn't, that didn't that didn't hold open on the last round. You you, you could only you could hear something was was different with. There's the something gun. different, yeah. There's something different, you know. You know, it's just no. Yeah. Next question. Uh, one of you guys brought up chemicals. Uh, what chemicals should an AR armor have on his bench or her? Especially if you have cro crocheted tools. Uh, especially greases, oils, thread lockers. Uh, where should they be used, and where should they not be used? I think that you know aero shell, you know, is 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 a, a really good one to have. I mean, you know, almost anything, whether it's castle nuts, barrel nuts, uh, you know, the, the aero shell is a good thing to have. A lot of companies actually sell them in like little tiny bottles or not bottles, but containers. We buy ours in the big tubes, uh, but I mean that that would last the rest of your grandkids' life unless you're building guns on a you know on a massive scale, uh, you know blue loctite uh red loctite uh um you know rock sets 
Uh, and you're and you want to you want you also want to be checking like you know this stuff doesn't last forever, right? I mean, some yeah. of this stuff ha- it has an expiration date, it has a it has a shelf life. So make sure you're you're looking at that. If you're a high volume type of place, you're going to burn through it before it expires. But if it just sits on your shelf for a couple of years, you might not be doing the job effectively. I think uh, Chad mentioned some good stuff with uh, uh, Perma Blue or um, uh, uh, what is the other one, Chad? Not Perma Blue. Cold, cold, cold Blue. Cold Blue. Uh, Permanent marker. That, <clears throat> well, they actually make a they actually they make yeah. aluminum black markers, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, you definitely want some oil, right? So, like, you know, when you stake something in your 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 punt, you're knocking through that that protective finished in your your exposing substrate will hit that thing with perma blue and then once it starts to darken once that oxidizing starts then you want to you know give it a second and then hit it with some kind of oil to to like neutralize that and stop that oxidizing so it doesn't can like you know turn into rust right or you know it doesn't look like rust uh that's what oxidizing is right and it kind of gives it that factory finish um those are some of off the top of my head chad what do you got uh, for my list, I put down Aeroshell 64. Um, uh, technically, I, I teach that this should be used any place where there is dissimilar metals. So castle nut, you know, castle nuts generally steel. Receiver extension is normally aluminum. Uh, barrel nut, um, you're dealing with an aluminum receiver, maybe a steel or aluminum barrel nut. Um, so any place where there's dissimilar metals, I like to use Aeroshell as an assembly lubricant. Um, thread lockers. I normally use uh, Loctite certain types for certain things. Rock set. Um, rock set I normally use for high temperature areas of the gun. So uh, if it's a muzzle device that isn't using a crush washer, it uses a solid shim. Normally I use rock set on the muzzle device, mainly a suppressor mount. Uh, if it's something on the gas block, uh, you could use something like a high temperature red Loctite or rock set. I prefer rock set just because of its heat capability. Rock set won't break down. You have to get it over 2000 degrees. Your barrel, your barrel's going to melt before the rock set cuts out. But that can be a debated topic. Um, red is better than nothing. Um, what do you, th- what do you think about the water solubility of rock set? That's a good point. So if you're building a gun for, uh, a law enforcement agency, right? And they do stuff like on the water, like uh, do they call it DNR in Texas, Mike? They call right. it DNR here. Okay, yeah. Or fishing game, something like that. Uh, sure, sure. Or you, or you, or you live, or you live a lot, you live around the beach, or you live in an area where that yep. weapon could be exposed to a lot of, you know, water. I haven't done en- enough testing on mild exposure to water, but that's definitely a factor you have to consider. So maybe. Um, Loctite, even though it might not have the temperature range, would be a better replacement for rock set. And let's just call it a maritime environment without being too tactical, right? So there's there's always the the pro and con. Uh, fantastic point. Um, you talked about the touch-up stuff, cold blue, aluminum black. Um, penetrating oil, I like to use crow oil. So if you got something that's really stuck, some penetrating oil. Um, and one of the most important things on my workbench is degreaser. Oh, yeah. degreaser so if you're going to use a thread locker uh, it can't do its job if things still have oil or preservatives on it so uh, i like to use acetone need to be careful about it but i got these little pump dispensers that i keep at benches um they use them in like nail salons but basically you just pump the cap and it pulls up and then you can use like a, a brush or a cotton swab or a rag and get just enough of it um, but i'm big on degreasing um, one of my other favorite thread lockers, I call it a low temperature thread locker, is uh, made by a company called Vibertite. It's called VC3. So I call that my my cold temperature thread locker. So if you've got a thread in bolt catch, it's great for that. If you've got a thread in uh, forward assist retaining pin, it's good for that. Um, if you want to use thread locker for your pistol grip screw, uh, optics bases and mounts, it works really good for um, Mike's going to hate me for this, but if you don't stake your castle nut, um, the VC3 actually works in that place, but there's caveats there. We're talking about like different types of thread engagement, thread classes. It gets highly technical. So, um, don't try to pit me against Mike. Everyone that's watching this. I'm not saying you shouldn't stake. I'm saying that, um, maybe if you're using certain materials that can't be staked, your end plates, aluminum, the Vibratite might be a suitable replacement 
in lieu of staking, but staking still good thing to do. So things like Vibratite BC3, I'm a big fan of. It's easy to get off 200 degrees, it breaks down, or acetone or fingernail polish remover. So you don't have to have a blowtorch or a heat gun. Um, you don't have to muscle it. It just comes loose when you want it to, and it's really easy to work with. But that's that's my chemical list, if you will. I was going to add to that. One, one of the things that it's on every workbench that we use quite a bit is a uh, gun scrubber. I guess that Birchwood Casey gun scrubber. I I love that stuff, man. It, it blows right through carbon, blows you know through grease. We use. I'm pretty sure we kill at least one whooping crane a, a day with the. I mean, it's very toxic shit, but that. But the, that gun scrubber is pretty good. And, and to go back to what Chad said about like, you're not pitting us against each other, that's the thing. I mean, if you understand what you're doing, then, you know, some of these techniques, if you understand, like, you know, using a, a mild thread locker in some of those applications is not wrong. You know, you know, I, I don't disagree with that. To me, the reason why I think like staking was a big deal, I mean, number one, I, I believe that it is the textbook correct way to do that particular job, right? The other thing too, though, is that if you're inspecting like large numbers of something, or you, you know, if someone handed me a gun I never saw before, and they're hey, have you seen this new gun, man? It's from uh, Big Dick Tactical or whatever. The very first thing, the very first thing I look at is that castle nut, and if that thing's not staked correctly, it tells me a little bit about the competence or the give a shit of the person who built that gun. Now, with that being said, there are exceptions. You know, knights, the way they talk about their thread class, you know, the the the, the F5 threads, right? Or what is it? Um, or, you know, or what, what, what Chad is saying in the application that he's talking about, I would agree that is an effective way to do that. Um, you just, you have to, you, you have to have an understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. And you have to make sure that the technique that you're using is going to accomplish that. Part of the reason why I teach it the way that I do is because, you know, when I'm certifying armorers for state agencies or I'm certifying people for this stuff, I I always think to myself that my curriculum has to withstand the scrutiny of testimony. You know, if if you're called to testify as to why you did something to a weapon, well, if I, if I taught it in my curriculum and I'm like, well, it's coming out of the TM, you know, this is why we teach it this particular way that, that to me is, you know, uh, so I want to be careful to say there's, there's not always just one right way to do that. Sometimes you have to look into the why, you know, something's taught and maybe a few layers deep and it's not always, well, this is the only way it can be done. Like, no, that's not true. Sometimes you're doing it because of a procedural reason. Or like yeah. I said, you know, I want this thing to withstand this, the scrutiny of uh cross-examination or, you know, perhaps you're inspecting something and you can't look under those threads to see if it was there. You know, I mean, so there's there's other, you know, just if you understand what you're doing, it makes a little bit of a difference. I think there's a word that you just used that was really important with what the first thing you check, and it's that you're looking for things to be done incorrectly. Whether it's there or not, it's it's the incorrect aspect because that incorrect aspect is showing you, okay, if they're willing to do it crappy here, let's check the bolt, let's check the bolt carrier group now. Is there is it incorrect there too? I, I, I think Chad would agree with this that a lot of times, more times than not, if you were to look at that spot on a gun and it's done poorly or not yeah. done or whatever, I bet you if you open that gun, you would find some other questionable things happening there. Yeah. You know, uh, usually materials, it's like, you know, methods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can start making some educated guesses there now. Again, that doesn't mean there's always one right way to do things. No, but it does help to at least have a standard from which to start. I think it comes down to pride in work, right? Which we've we've lost, unfortunately, or there's a lot less of it. Well, that actually goes into one of the questions coming up. I'm not quite there yet, but it's going to be focused on Mike. Well, I'm going to ask it in a minute. I have other other questions to ask before we get there. Um, Matt Dropko had a, a cool thing that he brought up. So not everyone's at the same level. Um, everyone has different skill levels, different experience. He brought up the idea of using a large plastic bag over a over a, an area that you're working in case things fly away. A, a way to uh, catch parts. I thought, you know what? Yeah. That's it's not a bad idea. 
It's a good way to huff some gun scrubber. That too. too. Like, <laughs> that too. <laughs> Spray paint inside. Huff. But you no, know, if there are things that are going to be springs, detents, or whatever, and if you're afraid of dropping stuff, putting everything in a bag, not a bad idea. It's a clear bag. We need to specify on that. Um, I'm making sure we're not repeat. There was a question uh, type and size of screwdriver best for torquing muzzle devices. <laughs> screwdriver. Yeah. That's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Flat blade screwdriver. There you go. Just, <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Um, okay. What's the workup process for training someone to be an assembler for the shop? Mike. Um, it's a, it's, it's quite a bit. So most of the guys that are armorers for Sons of Liberty, um, they start out doing like an internship um, or some of them are hired straight out, but they're usually doing something like receiving. And it sucks because there's a guy there some days with a postal scale wearing, you know, weighing buffers. <laughs> you know, I mean, cause you know, it's, it says H or H2 on the face, but you know, a human still probably assembled it and, you got to make sure that, you know, they weren't, uh, it wasn't tequila Tuesday or something, right? So, you know, you know, you still, you're still doing that. The, there, there is gauging upon receiving things back from plating, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're gauging port sizes, you're using ring gauges to check, uh, the journals, you're there's, I mean, there's, there's the, the, the QC checklist upon receiving from certain things is tremendous. The internal diameter of gas blocks. Um, you know, there's go, no go chat has actually helped us quite a bit with like even developing some of this stuff. And we're even sourcing more and more and more gauges because it does make a huge difference, right. To, to be able to, to look at some of that stuff. So you, you, you might be there just in the receiving gauging QC, that kind of thing for a very long time. And in having done that thousands of reputa rep repetitions, you start to learn a little bit and then, you know, they go to product support where, you know, you're, you're packing LPKs or something, right. You know, so I mean, like, again, it's just this constant familiarization with like components, what they're supposed to look like, what, you know, what things, what, what, what you're kind of getting a very ground up uh, idea of what makes this gun. The armor side of things, it's kind of, you know, you kind of eventually graduate to armor and you're, you're monitored by every other armor in the, in the shop, you know, and you're, you're, you start being tasked with like smaller assembly procedures that's looked at. And then of course, you know, as after you become an armorer there, we don't let the guy who built the gun inspect the gun. Right. So that's why there's two slots on that signature on that certificate. There's the armor who built it. And then there's the armor who inspected it. And we don't let people inspect their own work. So even even the guys that have been there for years, guys that have built thousands of guns, they still have a separate set of eyes go over their gun, and uh, you know, and we change those that QC position out because we don't you don't want to get burnout, you don't want to get complacency, right? You know, and you're you're kind of moving that that rotation around, and I, and honestly, we have extremely few. Uh, you see issues because we've built that, you know, all of those processes we've built into place, but I'll tell you what, somebody is not going to wrench a gun for, you know, a commercial for a customer, uh, until they've been there. I don't know, you know, six months, you know, six months. I mean, um, and, and honestly, it's kind of a big deal to, to graduate to that position. Um, so it's a pretty long, it's a pretty long workup. Cool. Now we're at the spare parts part. So obviously, uh, if we're looking at scale for an individual, an individual is definitely going to have a different scale of parts. They're going to have an individual may only need one, two, three spare whatevers, whereas an agency may need considerably more. Um, talking about the individual, what are the parts kits or what are the specific parts that you guys are needing to replace on a reg more regular basis. So I think a, a, a roll pin is a one use item, right? I mean, we, you know, whenever you remove a roll pin from a weapon, it goes into the trash can. Well, I can tell you, I don't care if the elves of Narnia built it. Eventually your gun's going to need a, a new ejector spring. 
and you're gonna have to remove that ejector roll pin in order to get to you know replace that spring right um my idea of like spare parts what they should look like i mean i, I think everyone should have a few ex, you know spare extractors extractor springs in, extractor uh inserts ejector springs spare ejectors certainly roll pins for all of those components and here's the deal right this isn't like just my fault the way i've always looked at this and this might seem like a negative nancy kind of view but uh i've seen what it looks like when the parts dry up you know i mean i i, I knew i remember one time early on we were in in the early part of the rush and there was you know just hundreds if not you know over a thousand you know orders stacked up that we were supposed to build and we couldn't because we didn't have port door c clips you know you didn't have a port door you know rod retaining clip and like that that you could not finish that gun there was no way to retain the the, the, the port door or the the rod so i mean we've obviously changed how we do some of that stuff but think about what happens if you if there was ever a situation where the truck stopped running, you know, or if there was ever a situation of some type of either unrest or, you know, catastrophic failure of the grid or something like that, like there's no UPS truck anymore, you know, and I, I promise you to keep a gun running, you, you need extractors, you need, you need uh, ejectors, you need spare springs that make those parts go, um, you know, depend on if you're, if you're stocking up spare parts for, just normal maintenance, that list might look a little bit different than if you're stocking up parts to sustain that gun after things have gone poorly. Chad? You want my advice here? Yeah, what, what parts should people have? Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of perishable items on the gun. Um, you have what I call the smaller perishable parts and then the larger perishable parts. The larger parts would be the bolt and the barrel. A lot of people worry about the carrier for the most part. Um, you really don't have to worry about the bolt carrier if it's made right. Um, you might have to replace a carrier key if it gets damaged, something happens to it. But for the most part, the the big the big replaceable parts of the bolt and the barrel, um, and Mike and I probably um, have the same idea about this. But um, you'll know when the barrel needs to be replaced by how it behaves, right? And I'm a big proponent of using uh, metrics to decide when a part needs to be replaced. A lot of the times, um, and, and this comes down to how you have to teach certain people. Some people want a round count schedule, right? They're like, okay, well, I want to replace these parts at this round count. And I normally ask people, um, give me an honest assessment of how many rounds your gun has had through it. And they give me the deer in the headlights. Look, they're like, I have no idea. And I'm like, okay, so that's, that's an honest answer. So let's look at the individual wear parts whether they be the larger components or the small perishable stuff and try to create a standard for when you should pay attention to what's going on, right? How, how worn is it? Is there a test that we can do to justify replacing it? I've taught agencies that have been taught by other armors that you should replace the gas tube every 5,000 rounds. Holy crap. And if, if you're if you're using Colt rifles and you're buying gas tubes from Colt, I know they get a better price, but retail for a Colt gas tube is like sixty dollars. So that's pretty expensive to replace gas tubes when they don't need to be replaced. So I like to create a test for as many parts of the gun as possible that are perishable items, wear items, um, and then I'll use the round count thing mainly for the barrel and the bolt, the 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 larger wear items. Um, if the barrel starts behaving poorly, the barrel gets replaced. I generally like to replace the bolt about halfway through the service life, depending on what the bolt's made of. Um, not because it has to be, it's because I just don't want an unexpected failure of a lug or at the break at the cam pin. Now I have gauges to tell me when it's gonna break, so I have an advantage over most, most armors. Um, so I can detect it when I'm doing my basic maintenance without using a round count. But short of that, I like to say, okay, Barrel gets replaced when it behaves poorly. 
uh, bolt gets replaced about halfway through what you expect out of the barrel life. And then the, all the other things, gas rings, cam pin, extractor, ejector. Uh, and when I say extractor, ejector, I'm talking about the assembly. Uh, firing pin, firing pin, retaining pin, um, cam pin. All of those things have a test that I use or an examination that I use to determine whether or not it should be replaced. Doesn't mean that the gun's not going to work if you don't replace it, but I like to teach um, preventative maintenance when I talk about getting parts out of a gun. A lot of people are like, well, um, you know, he's being obsessive about this. I'm not being obsessive. The reason that I have a schedule for it is because I've seen enough of it to say, okay, if you ignore this, something bad is probably going to happen to your gun. And it's going to happen when you don't want it to happen. So I prefer to say, all right, uh, maybe you should replace the cam pen now before the cam pen causes your bolt to break because it's got so much slop in it and it transfers the energy to the bolt. Maybe you should replace your firing pin because the tip is eroded heavily. And just because it sticks out far enough now doesn't mean that it will after a case of ammo goes to the gun. Um, but that's my mindset. I'd like to hear Mike's thought on it. No, I, I agree. I mean, like I use the action spring as kind of an example for that, right? You know, if you look at what an action spring should be, like a carbine action spring, like the what that measurement is. And I, I'm trying to remember what the, I think it's like 10 and a quarter whenever it's been compressed to the point of like, you know, your suggested swap, right? You know, once the, the spring has set after thousands of compression, decompression cycles. Now, will your, will your weapon continue to work once it has set to be to shorter than that the answer is probably right but if you're talking about a fighting gun you know you don't want to be playing in the probably range you want to be dealing with some kind of mechanical certainty and or as as certain as you can humanly get right and so by you know you don't drive your car until the engine seizes you're beating you know? your gun to hell right so if you were to inspect these components and as they're even getting you know less than optimal you could keep that weapon in optimal readiness by you know maybe not waiting until that spring to set all the way to, to to failure, you know, or observing the gun. If you're shooting a weapon and you're noticing, you know, brass kind of just trickling out of the gun, maybe you don't have to wait for a failure to eject to go ahead and, and deal with that ejector uh, now just based upon observation. And I like what Chad said a lot. And there's a couple things I want to remind the viewers of this. So round counts, in my opinion, don't typically mean shit. They just don't, right? Because there's so many other variables that go into that. You know, if, is the weapon suppressed? Okay, well, the uh, you know, the, the the service life on a component, you know, per the maintenance schedule on round count is dramatically different on a suppressed weapon versus an unsuppressed weapon, okay? And then what kind of service life or what is the round count on a gun that has been subjected to saltwater spray or saltwater corrosion? Because oh you know you're saying oh this particular component's gonna last ten thousand rounds, but he ain't gonna last five hundred rounds if the fucker's been rusted shut, right? So like <laughs> you know so you, you so round count doesn't tell you anything hardly ever. It's it's there, there's observable metrics. There's 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 measurements. There's things that you can empirically look at. There's uh, the observation of the behavior of the gun. Okay, and then you know the other thing to consider too is if you were to look at these this the prescribed uh, maintenance schedule on certain military weapons you have to remember that the people who wrote that are also in the business of selling replacement parts so if they tell you to replace x component at this round count that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the predicted service life it means that that's how i sell you 10 extra widgets per gun on a military contract that's not always necessarily uh you know true preventative stuff so again uh, round count, in my opinion, uh, is is the least reliable way to gauge uh, or to understand, like you know what what something's doing. I and mean, then I, I agree again with Chad. You know, bolts, barrels, those are certainly you know components that you know, it, depending on if you're what you're planning for, right? If you're planning to you know just normal maintenance of weapons, but again, uh, action springs. The, you know, a lower receiver, I think, can last almost you know indefinitely, barring something catastrophic, barring some you know something super crazy. A lower receiver, I don't think, has a shelf life or even a, a round count life or anything else. I mean, I've seen guns with well into the hundred thousand plus range on a lower receiver without any real issues. Um, but you know, it springs springs eventually do fail. Um, but I, I mean. So off the top of my head, man. I mean, again, I'm always focused 
like I'm so thinking about Milo, right? Where it's, you know, magazines, you know, magazines are something, you know, ejector and extractor, you know, of course, ammunition, lubrication and operator. But, I, you know, to me, I, I'm all, for some reason, my mind always comes back to that damn bolt assembly and all the little shit because it's involved in every single step of the cycle of operation. Mm-hmm. So if I understand you correctly, Chad, you said you use gauges. <laughs> yes, yes, there, there, there are these things that I invented that no one has ever used before, and I've I, right. I created them just to sell to trick people in the classes so I could sell them tuition. <laughs> well, he fooled me. He got me. I'm a sucker right here. <laughs> Mike's just throwing money away buying them from me too. So what happens if you're attending a class two times in a row? Does that mean I'm double, double bitch? Yep. You, you, you've been duped so bad, Josh. <laughs> it's a rough <laughs> life. It's hard. Uh, pe- people forget that, um, that, you know, gauges have been used, you know, back since the, uh, the, the revolutionary war times, they would gauge, you know, the, the bore sizes so they could figure out what projectiles to cast for the, the, the musket or the rifle. Right. It's nothing new. Um, it, it just gives you something that the human isn't capable of, of observing. So um, especially modern farms that are, you know, gas operated or recoil operated. If parts are heavily worn from, you know, environmental factors, from shooting and usage, uh, maybe from abusive cleaning, a gauge will tell you whether or not something is worn beyond what you can touch and detect or see and detect. Uh, so it's really important to understand that certain amounts of maintenance or lack of maintenance or too much maintenance can affect how the gun works. And a gauge can tell you that it can tell you whether or not it's made to the right dimension. It can't tell you if it's made of the right stuff. Um, but it can tell you whether or not parts are going to get along. And that's the main thing that I, that I teach is not, um, you know, is part a perfect and is part B perfect. It's no, we can take two imperfect parts. If an oversized part here, interfaces with an undersized part here all is well with the world it's how imperfect parts can work perfectly together and that's what gauges can tell you no i I, i'll touch on that i agree we teach this too and it's called stacking tolerance and this is one of the main differences between like factory built guns from reputable places and home built guns one of the differences and i'm not saying I'm not putting down people that build guns at their house because I was I started out building guns at my house and we obviously sell components to customers so they can't build guns at their house, right? I mean, but I will tell you, if you go buy a gas block and that gas block is in spec within the tolerance range and you go buy a barrel from some other place and that barrel journal is in spec under the tolerance range, but this one passed on the low side and this one passed on the high side of acceptable and now you put those two components together you have stacked those tolerances and you've created an issue right so whereas you know what 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 uh chad is saying you know in the in a shop where you have like things pass within a certain range acceptable range well you were sitting there hand pairing the low side with the low side you know or you know and so on and so forth where everything is always you're, you're stacking those tolerances in your favor. It is easy to sometimes stack those tolerances out of your favor. So yeah, two perfect parts, no. Or can you take parts that stack and complement each other in that way? Again, it's ha- it's it's you have it's under be- you have to be able to understand the system, though. I think to take advantage of what Chad's talking about, them. Yeah, I've got two points on that. So one. Uh, people like Mike may hate me for saying this. Chad said this in his class, and I absolutely love it. Um, he said, look, you want a barrel? Buy 10. Pick two, send the rest back. I'm like, ooh, that's that's sexy. It pisses off manufacturers, but that, that's one way to do it from home. Uh, but the, you know, from an outsider's perspective, when people diss uh, gauging or inspections or this and that, it's always confounded me or boggled me because it's almost like asking a a contractor to build you a home and say you're not allowed to use the tape measure. Can you imagine what that home would end up being? Like, what are you talking about? Like anything you do in life that's precision, you you have to you have to measure it. You have to measure it somehow, some way, right? And I mean, a tape measure is a bad example because you know, look up the memes of two tape measures side by side, right? 
So we're dealing with much more precise tolerances, which then makes it that much more important to measure. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know why people are get their panties in a bunch over this. It just makes no sense to me. Well, it's because they've never pushed a weapon to like to failure. I, I mean, like the if you look at the average person talking shit on the internet, they don't actually shoot guns. They damn sure don't fucking work on them. Okay. The, if you look at the meme makers and the chart makers and the tier makers and all those, these aren't shooters, you know, because I'll tell you what, like that, that efficiency that, you know, a gauge was meant to measure is going to make a big difference when you're pushing that gun to its outer operational, mm -hmm. the, the outer edge of its operational envelope. Okay. The more efficient gun is going to go further. And I, we, we just got done with, um, you know, an endurance test for some project that we were working on. It was a it was a ten thousand round string of fire, okay. And like, and honestly, you know, you're not worried about you know the the reason why I think the test is designed that way is like nobody really cares about the first five thousand or seven thousand or whatever. Like, really, where you start separating shit is in that last five percent of the performance envelope. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you're that's what you're looking for, right? You know, like you know, there's. I think any rifle can get through a couple of hundred rounds, you know, at, at your grandpa's pawn, right? But whenever you're starting to like push something to the outer edge, well, you can have a you could have a pretty high predictability of performance of guessing what that thing's gonna do at the outset simply by knowing that these these measurements and materials and these things have, have gone together to the best of your ability. It should do this. Now barring something anomalous. Right, but it should. <laughs> if if you dis if you discount having some type of standard for that, it's because you've never asked the gun to to go the extra fucking inch. You just haven't, and you've never had to fix them once they didn't. And that's where my gauging. If it's not a copy of a government gauge, that's where it comes from. I've seen a failure. I've seen where failures are starting to come up, and I basically find a way to detect that, and I make a gauge that looks for it. And some people are like, well, that's dumb. That's fine. Shoot your gun <laughs> until it fails. It doesn't hurt me none. But I, I, I mean, it's true. Like you talk about, you know, some of the head spacing issues. Well, okay. Well, now the gun's getting really hot and it's getting really fouled. And I'm talking really fouled. And there's all kinds of shit in there. And your margin of error, the, the operational envelope keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Let me tell you, man, if you start with the right spot, it's going to... It's going to uh, diminish, but still into some type of window. If you start at the very bottom edge of acceptable, it's going to diminish right out of that window a lot faster than you think. I mean, just talk to anyone who's ever had to assess a weapon, like, you know, for real. Yep. Nobody gets bent out of shape when you, when you, uh, you know, you check things when you're building the engine for your hot rod, right? Good thing. But how dare you try to be precise when you're putting together a weapon? That, that's the interesting thing I find about the gun space. I mean, I don't know. I don't hang out in the automotive space enough to make, maybe it's the same thing there. There's a lot of ego in the gun space. And to where if you make corrective suggestion or, or for some reason, there's almost like a disdain for expertise in, in this field. And I see it with my friends who are world-class instructors for shooting. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen a guy who uh you know like has like a, a normal day job and you know like is a casual shooter like angrily correct like the amu guy who that's his fucking job and has been for years is putting rounds on target and you're you're telling him is you know or um you know or i have seen people uh you know kind of go after chad or myself and i'm like this is all we do like for the last thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of our life like this is all we do and if we're making a corrective suggestion on something uh it's it's coming from like a real place you know and i don't know why people take the gun thing and, and it, it's so ego or they take it personal or they get so attached to a, a brand or a belief to where it's almost like religious i i i don't personally understand why that is different than is it like that in the automotive space? Are any of you guys gearheads? I don't know. Midge. 
I mean, did, did, is that kind of fucking shit there? Uh, I mean, I'm more in the the cheap side of stuff, so it's not like high performance. You know, well, I'm that's doing... dumb then. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty lame. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I know some guys that are into the high performance motors and stuff like that. But that's, I mean, that's a whole nother world. I mean, they're they're dyno testing their motors outside of the car, right? Like they're doing anything and everything they possibly, and they're putting 16 different intakes on it. They're putting three different turbochargers, like. They're testing every little thing they can, and they're like, oh, this one part has 0.1% better performance at X RPM. Okay, we're going to use that, right? I mean, that's how you get to anything high-end, right? That's just how life works. You know, Chad and I were talking about this over dinner whenever he came to town. You know, I, I sat through Chad's class at my shop, and I, you know, learned a ton. All of my guys that have worked for Sons – for you know years learned a ton there's a level of insight there that we get chad has been to some of my classes and chad and i are both i I think we're perpetual students over the last over the last year i can honestly tell you that my per my perspective on the rifle has changed dramatically when i started incorporating some of the other stuff beyond just the reliability aspect but then you look at the shootability then having to look at corrosion then having to look at blah, blah 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 whatever um perpetual students the moment you have nothing to learn or like the moment you know it all like i mean well, you've achieved something that I, I you know neither of us have you know so i got one last one i don't think i have anything to learn yeah <laughs> so i got one last question for you guys because of time brian i can't get yours um and it's kind of a loaded question when it comes to those spare parts or it comes to those tools, where are the places that you go to get them? So it's our society.com. See, that's why this is kind of a loaded question. <laughs> um, I'll jump in if Mike's okay with it first, and then I'll let him finish off uh, his thoughts on it. Um, you can take a look at the two things that I'm wearing. It's sort of a hint where you can get some, some parts from, um, I had good experiences with both. You're going to pay a lot more for this one than you will this one. Um, and you get pretty good quality, um, both ways. So, uh, just think about where you're buying parts from just because it's a deal doesn't mean that it's a deal. Um, I see lots of cheap gas rings in the market. I see lots of cheap firing pins in the market, cheap firing pin retaining pins, so just think about where you're buying your consumable parts um, and buy enough that you can you can have them on the side without trying to build a gun out of them. A lot of people have spare parts like, well, time to build a new gun. No, those are your spares. Um, but you can get good parts for spares from Sons of Liberty. Um, not saying you have to go direct with them, but pick up their distributors, uh, their, 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 their retailers and, and buy some parts. They keep them in stock. I think Brownell sells Sons of Liberty stuff now, right, Mike? Well, yeah, I, I think all of the small replacement parts are actually the Brownells. The, I, mean, I think we supply most of them. I think whenever Colt stopped, we, we started uh, supplying a lot of those for Brownells. And I've, I've seen no significant metric difference between, and I did, I would like, uh, I would only buy Colt firing pins because I saw so many problems with other firing pins. Um, and when Colts weren't in stock, I was like, all right, I'm going to pick up some sun stuff. And I saw no discernible difference in materials, quality, overall finish, uh, dimensions. So, um, it's not because me and Mike are friends and I rarely do this, but, um, I buy a lot of their stuff because I don't have to send a lot of it back. Um, and if I do find something that's slightly out of spec with any company, um, I like to label it. Um, so let's say I have a firing pin that's too long, right, with several bolts. I won't send that firing pin back. I'll put it in a baggie and put long on it. So when I run into a bolt that's on the plus size of overall length, there's my fix. I got a firing pin that makes that bolt assembly work right. Um, when it comes to tools, it's sort of all over the place. There's no one source. Brownells is a great source for a lot of stuff, but I get stuff all over the place. I buy some stuff at Harbor Freight. I buy some stuff from Amazon, um, Brownells, Midway, um, 
gauges you can get from places like Pacific Tooling Gauge. Some are specific gauges from like uh, uh, Meyer or uh, Vermont Tool. Um, Good. It really is a long list of where you would have to source stuff. And uh, I have some lists like in the social groups that I, I participate in. Um, but you really need to be careful about where you're buying your spare items from, especially your consumables, because those consumables will be consumed faster if they're not made right dimensionally and they're not made of the right material. Yeah, so, like this would be a, a, a normally a good opportunity to plug, uh, plug my, but, but truthfully, and this is how I teach the class. And, um, you know, there, there are, first of all, nobody's perfect. No, nobody's infallible. I mean, every, no matter how hard you try, there's, there's, when there's a human being involved, you know, there, there could be an issue. I, I would stick to things. You can tell like certain, certain companies, certain brands, they, they really do market themselves on performance on performance on you know on that kind of uh and then those are typically the brands that also stand behind the products the most because you know there's a level of like pride in in there's an expectation of performance and in quality and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of companies in this industry that i i truly respect but the list is short the list is much shorter for the companies that i i really respect and the the companies that are in it or a quick buck and uh I, you, you can kind of tell like so um yeah I, I would i think we do a pretty good job you know what so does bcm so so does colt you know i think lmt does good work psionics i think is one of those brands that is sometimes underrated uh they're very good they're a very good brand um there's some and, and if you notice that the, these guys us we all uh it's a performance driven platform. That's how we set ourselves apart. And then of course, you know, you can tell the ones that have the post sale support, the end user support, that's also going to separate the wheat from the shaft, right? So I would Josh, highly suggest yeah. I would highly suggest taking a SOTAR class if you have not. Sons of Liberty classes is kind of like, you know, how do we keep this thing running in uh the uh in the apocalypse? Uh Chad's class, I think, is a bit more refined and like, uh, you know, uh, precise. Um, they're both, I think, they're both good classes to look at. Take a yes. Suns class, everyone watch and take one. Yeah, Suns is definitely on my list. I'm, I'm, you know, obviously it's Sotar, Illuminati, but I really, really want to get into it, Suns. Josh, any, uh, recommendations on sources for parts or uh tools um honestly a lot of my small parts are done i hate to say that because everyone said it but they really are um like suns spring co um that kind of stuff you know very very select few couple brands that i i really trust for some of the small components um but, you know, it kind of goes back a little bit to what Chad was saying earlier is you really want to inspect your parts prior to because, for example, you know, I, I, a lot of guys will bring to Chad a big pile of shit, for lack of a better term. I mean, they, they want him to help them try to make they, – they're trying to stump him, I think. I don't know. I could be wrong, but, you know, they'll bring a big pile of shit and they'll say, let's put this together. And he's like, okay, we can put that together, right, um, which is always fascinating to see. So I did kind of an interesting aspect when I went to the first class. I did both sides. I brought some of the most expensive parts I possibly owned and some of the cheapest, right? And needless to say, I'm not going to name names, but I had by far the most expensive bolt carrier group there, and it was by far the worst bolt carrier group there. I mean, it wasn't even close. So we sent that back to the manufacturer, ended up getting one back, neither here nor there, but the biggest hurdle there and specifically why i'm bringing this up is if you looked at the carrier it was so rough your gas you know the rings themselves they would be gone within i don't know a thousand rounds 1500 rounds 2000 rounds so then your gun is 
you know, now you're running with a subpar gun and it's leaking gas and it's doing, so there's, there's a given and take on both sides. Like one side, inspect your parts to begin with, know what you have, have good parts. That's going to make your maintenance side a whole lot easier. Right. Then, you know, obviously document all that first aspect. Then that gives you the foundation to be able to maintain the gun properly. I mean, again, I'm, I'm a hobby guy in my own garage, but that that's kind of the way I look at things. Good stuff. So basically in summation, um, tier lists are dumb. <laughs> Imagine so, that. <laughs> not that we talked about that, but yeah. Um, let's get some final thoughts and some final plugs, plug whatever you want, whatever you represent, name names. If you are so inclined, uh, Chad. Uh, I'm just happy to be on here again, Matt. Um, I appreciate, uh, having the opportunity to share it with, uh, with your crew, your audience. Um, I try not to plug myself for classes. Uh, I just try to stay in my lane. And if people want to get nerdy, I would love to have you in a class. If not, I try to give away a lot of free information when I have time through different manners of social media, whether it be Facebook or my private group that I run uh, or YouTube. Um, if you want to subscribe to my stuff and support me in some small way, that still will help. Uh, if you want to buy, you know, some chemical that I sell on my website or buy merchandise, all those little things help keep the lights on. Um, but also support other people in the community that care about what they do. Uh, people like Mike, um, people like Josh that make great gear. Um, if we don't support each other, uh, we're going to end up shutting our doors like some, some companies are already doing. Um, and we just got to take care of each other, especially people that take pride in what they do that aren't pumping out junk just as the lowest common denominator. The people that really love and have a passion for what they do, try to support them in whatever way you can. And I always appreciate it, whether people just follow my work or they, they buy a little bit from me or they come to a class. So thank you all. And of course, I forgot to fa say my favorite, support those sources that you found to be beneficial. Pay attention to who these guys represent and who they mention. And Chad said it better than me. Mike, I'll, I'll use a quote from Will Larson, and it's I think it's very, very true. And uh, we used to always joke watching the fluctuation of this industry. And he would say, buy cheap, stack deep, because right now this is a buyer's market. And, you know, the ammo is fairly plentiful. Mags are easy to find. We're not seeing a ton of supply chain issues. Uh, most manufacturers have a little bit of a chance to catch their breath and, you know, like things are okay. If you don't think things are going to get fucking bizarre between now and November of 2024, you're out of your mind. I don't know what they're going to throw at us. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's COVID part seven or if it's fucking aliens or whatever that, whatever it is, like whatever the market condition is right now is not going to look like this as you get closer and closer to probably one of the most bizarro elections of our lifetime and this isn't a sales pitch because we're we're still you know this year sons liberty is still is, has, is still experiencing significant growth over last year because we've expanded our footprint we've been taking on bigger projects this isn't a sales pitch i'm telling like my fellow shooters and people that that care about this stuff like ammo might not be cheaper than it is right now Ma you know magazines i don't sell ammunition okay i don't, I don't really sell magazines you know but like, you know, some of the spare parts I'm talking about, extractor springs, things like that, no one's going to get rich and retire off of selling some extractor springs, but you might not be able to get them as things get weird. And I suspect that they will. That's, I'm not a pessimist, but I, I have been watched, I have been paying attention for the last couple of years. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And it's interesting to look back. Matter of fact, I look at my uh, Facebook memories showing posts from the past and looking at, well, 9-11 was a good example. Remembering that, that the, the terror people were experiencing and thinking it's the end of the world. Look, I can't believe this just happened. What's happening next? Then we have COVID and we've had all these practice sessions for ourselves personally to have stuff ready or to examples of, yeah, maybe we need to stock up on X. Maybe we need those spare parts are people actually doing that or are they taking it for granted? You know what? Tomorrow's going to be fine. We don't need it. We don't need to order it now. Wait long enough and you're going to find yourself without because there's going to be that point where guess what? No more internet. 
or yeah and when this thing when whatever when it when the when the hysteria starts it's a, it's too late because i mean by then you, you can't react fast enough to the to the condition of human stupidity you, you just can't you can't outrun human stupidity <laughs> yeah yeah and going back to again 911 and covid how has the world changed after those considerably we could have another large scale thing happen tomorrow and how is that going to affect our world? We don't know. So now's the time to act. Now's the time to take those classes. Now's the time to stock up. What a what a happy su- subject. Huh? <laughs> God, love it. Josh, what do you got for us? <laughs> On that point, if you if you don't think some of this stuff is going to disappear in the next year, did you think toilet paper was going to disappear? Because <laughs> I sure as hell didn't. And yet I was the one that was stocked up. All of my employees, all of my friends, they were giving me shit. And the way I looked at it was, okay, COVID happened. Where did it originate? It originated in China. Okay, great. What comes out of China? In my mind, it was paper and soap and anything that had any kind of manufacturing touch in China. So I just bought a year's supply. Whoops, did he do? Next thing I know, two months later, no one can fucking buy toilet paper. So, I mean, that's a terrible example, but that it's just eye-opening. We, I mean, things are so uncertain. Things are moving so fast. I mean, just just plan ahead. It's not that hard. Right. Um, but back to the matter of pertaining hand, uh, I, Chad won't, won't brag on himself, but I will brag on Chad. If you, if you need to learn anything or you, if you have any desire to learn about the AR, jump on YouTube and look up Sotar. Like that is, that is the king for learning the weapon system. I mean, you just, just learn how it works. Right. And you'll digest it. It'll be hours and hours and hours of videos, but it's amazing. And then if you want to go down a deeper level, attend a class. I mean, you'll, you'll learn so much from a class that, I mean, I took, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 pages of notes and Chad was even giving me some crap. And I was like, no, this is, this is valuable information. This is what I came here for. This is, this is amazing. Right. Um, and stock up on your parts. Right. I mean, long story short, I don't, I don't want to, Shoot Mike's horn too much, but that M89, holy moly, that's that's on every single one of my rifles now. I've just I've swapped everything out. There's just no comparison, right? So find the good parts, stick with the good parts, don't mess around. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. That that's I mean, we're all kind of saying the same shtick, but you know, it is what it is, and it's a reality. No plugs. Josh, oh, come on. If, 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 you, if, you need, if you need soft gear sewn or anything like that, that that's that's my shtick. That's what we do. So we're we're laser cutting, we're automated sewing, we're we're all the above. We're even doing a little bit of metalworking. So whatever you guys need. Um the way I like to explain ourselves to more of an individual not in our industry, you know, your average person at Walmart that are like, Oh, well, what do you do? I the way I explain it is we do everything except for the uniform for special pools special force soldier, right? We don't want to deal with all the apparel. We don't want to deal with the sizes. You know, if, if we get down that road, maybe, but for now it, it, it's really, do you need your mag pouch? Do you need your plate cure? Do you need your belt? That That's kind of the, the stuff we do. Um, and we're also branching out of the tactical industry. We're now doing some, you know, medical stuff and some other stuff outside of it, which is nice just from a di- diversification standpoint. But yeah, if you guys need some, some stuff, let me know or hit up, you know, Matt, let him know he knows me. We'll, we'll make it happen. What's your what's your website? Exactly. Uh, yeah, you need stuff? to say your name. <laughs> Dancing Sasquatch Tech. It's an easy one to remember. <laughs> it's, good, it's good stuff, man. And honestly, I, I appreciate the level of give a shit that you put into things, man. Yep. Yep. No, it's just part of your work. That that I mean, I mean, that's something that we even. I'm constantly with my other guys here. Like, how do we get our own employees to have pride in their work? And one of the big game changers that we've seen recently was I had to walk out to my employees and be like, Hey guys, I'm not paying your paycheck. This plate carrier you're making, this belt you're making, this mag pouch you're making, that's X company. X company is paying your paycheck. Give a shit. And they went, Oh, so it kind of clicked for a little bit there. And you know, with certain people, it's, you're, you're dealing with a different bunch, but for a lot of the people that I have under my, you know, under us, they really clicked when we said that. And it was like, oh, okay, you know, it's I'm not the one paying their bills. It's it's the customer, right? And for, you know, Mike, it's the same deal. He's 
in touch with his consumer. If he's not in touch with his consumer, he doesn't have a, cons- a company, right? So that, that is what it is. I mean, welcome to welcome to life, right? So, but yeah, if you need soft goods, that, that's us. <laughs> and then also we connected to a, uh, some third-party companies as well, needing stuff that you were able to manufacture. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, Matt's brought me as of now two or three companies, which is which is awesome. I can't thank you enough for that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> well, that was a great discussion. Um, I had an idea of doing a Q and A session. We might still do that in the future. Uh, bring on these guys, and people can come in, jump on the panel, present a couple questions, and then run away. Um, that's that's a possibility. Uh, I think that could be a lot of fun. We kind of had that with the live chat that worked out really well. Some good questions were brought up, uh, especially screwdrivers specifically for muzzle devices. Cause that's come on. We've all done it. We have <laughs> all done it. Um, big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to big text ordinance, overwatch precision, Filster, primary arms, Walther. Lastly, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. All this, it takes time. It takes money. Time is money. It takes effort. Um, yeah, as soon as I'm done here, run upstairs, put the kid to bed, doing family stuff. And then I think I'll be playing video games all night because I'm on graves. Um, love to be able to do this. Um, have an episode. We're going to be revisiting the gauge episode. That's going to be, I don't remember if it was Thursday or Friday. Next week, we have an episode that's planned out talking about defense against fraud, kind of things to look out for when it comes to electronic fraud, banking and all that. That's definitely something we have never touched upon, but we have people in the network that specialize in it. So why not talk about it? Um, Because not everything's guns, gear, shooty, whatever. There are other aspects to our lives that it's important to to know. Let's see here. Have less lethal episode. Have have, a bunch of stuff is on the, on the back burners right now. Kind of nice to have that uh, planned out the way it is. Um, Again, big thanks to the panel. Great discussion. Uh, big thanks to those of you that watched live that presented some great questions. Um, I think that is everything I have. Oh, um, Mike and Chad, you guys do travel to a point for your classes. Chad, you're primarily just stationary, right? Yes. Yeah, the only time that I generally deviate, um, I, I came out to do the PNS uh, summit. Yeah. Um, so I'll do it like for industry type things. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, uh, you're, you're too important to travel. It really comes down to that. Um, I travel for manufacturers or for yeah. big events because um, my schedule is already sort of locked down. So I have to be very selective about when I can travel. Yeah. And when I do, um, I do it for people that I have good relationship with because they, they appreciate the work that goes into me traveling and trying to give them what I give in my shop. Uh, even, even that being said, I cannot teach a good, as good of a class when I travel than I can in my own shop. Everything's yeah. set up. I have workbenches. All the tools have everything. All, all the benches have all the tools they need. Everything is as flawless as possible so I can give as much information as possible. And when I travel, I have to leave some stuff behind and, um, it's just not as thorough. Um, I would like to do more travel training, but there's also some personal things that keep me sort of tethered to home. Um, I take care of my elderly grandmother. So in order for us to travel, I have to get either other family members or caregivers to come take over. So when I came out the PNS, um, we didn't have that going on. Yeah. Now we do. So fam- family takes priority uh, over the business as always. But um, we, we do our best to create a wide schedule so people can come when they have the opportunity during the year. But it is pricey. I mean, travel costs a lot of money. Uh, my classes are not cheap. They're probably the most expensive in the business. Um, and a lot of people take offense to that it's not done that way on purpose it's just the supply demand and what um, my time is worth so if people can afford it i love to have them if i could travel more to teach i would but right now it's mostly um in maryland where i teach my classes unless i do a special event for like pns or um i went out to sons but that was a that was a manufacturer class so that wasn't open to the public yeah Um, and also your electronic ankle monitor also limits your ability to travel too. 
<laughs> that is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Um, and it's, I, uh, I wonder how many people are going to take that serious. <laughs> it goes off whenever I travel into a state that I don't have a carry permit for. Yeah. <laughs> the person, the least likely person to ever have one of those on this panel is Chad. Um, and now the most likely. I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Mike, you're, you're, are you guys doing travel armor courses? Yeah. So, I mean, last year I was on the road 36 weeks out of the year. So, I mean, that, you know, and uh, I mean, sometimes you're, you're, t- you're teaching, you know, more than, you know, teaching two classes a week. Um, this year I scaled my travel back quite a bit to hang out with the kiddos a little bit more yeah uh, but but this fall uh we're ramping it back up and we have um a class up in ohio with aim surplus we have a we have a few classes scattered around and then next year i'll probably i'll, I'll be honest i as much as i bitched about being on the road i kind of got a little stir crazy being at home you know so I, I you know there's somewhere in the middle is like the perfect mix and next year i'll probably travel a little bit more um but yeah, we do. We we any anybody that wants to host us, you know, um, let us know. For the most part, we you know we we blast it out and, and they and they fill up pretty pretty quick. I love teaching that you know uh, some of our affiliate like you know like gun stores that carry our product in, in all fifty states. If you have a classroom, you know, put two or three of your put two or three of your employees through on the house. Like if yep. you have a, a shop that's already carry carrying Sons Liberty, you're welcome to host that class. Put two or three of your guys, you know, in the class for free. We'll fill up the rest of the class with, you know, paying students that come from that that area. And it's a it's a hell of a good time. Um so and and, and you just got two or three of your guys certified for simply hosting the class. Um, like I said, this year I scaled it back quite a bit, but I do miss I do it's still my favorite part of the job. My my favorite part of the job is still out there talking to students. Cool. Yeah, John the Fish Cop and I realized, oh, we might need to take a class soon. We might be expiring or expired. That's good to know options. Actually, so just a, a quick plug. So Sons Liberty L9, we just completed the Utah State Police contract. Yes, you did. The rifles. Yeah, so I, I'm definitely going to be teaching a class up there in Utah. Uh, man, by all means, dude, come come find I, me I, and bring I, the boys. Yeah, I, I my, my buddy John that works for the state and I – both are in need. I will definitely hit you up on that. Yeah. Cool. Well, good stuff. Um, I think that's everything. I guess I will talk to you guys later. <laughs>